All right, if you can stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you remain standing, Bob Barnett, our police chaplain, is going to give us our invocation this evening. Lord God, we begin this evening by inviting your presence here. We're always in need of your wisdom displayed through the people, the skills, the talents, the knowledge, the experience that they have. We pray, Lord God, that it would be obvious through the things discussed and decisions made, Lord, that your will for this city has been best done. And we're also here tonight to recognize people who have served the community. We ask a blessing upon them for their service and the way they've enhanced this place. In the name of the Lord, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, let's have uh, Wendy Tabiska, if you can join me down at the uh, microphone, please. Standing to my right is Wendy Tobiska. She was, now she's on my right. Um, and look, she's done so much for this city uh, for so long, it's difficult really to describe because, you know, back in 97, for example, she was on the cable uh, TV advisory board. Um, prior to that, 2005, she was on the Parks and Recs board. Um, and in, tenure, in her tenure in those boards, she did all sorts of citywide special events, uh, you know, having fun events, developing logos, getting people uh, fit, being respectful. Um, she uh, has a passion for kids and for art and for music, and we are very blessed to have her teaching at the Orange County uh, School of the Arts and the Musical Theater, to, uh, Theater Conservatory as well as a private audition coach for all ages. Um, she performed roles as uh, Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl, for which she was nominated to the prestigious Irene Ryan Award and the Mont uh, Kent uh, in Dames at Sea, being nominated for a Ravi Award for Best Actress. And, um, you know, Wendy, again, so many accomplishments in 2012, National Artist Teacher Fellow, and most recently, Wendy performed One Woman Cabaret Act uh, at venues in Hollywood and here throughout Orange County. So I'm going to present her in a moment with a, a, a tile here from the city. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, happy for her, but I'm also sad because I know she's going to be uh, leaving. You're still leaving, right? I'm still leaving. Okay. She's... She's going to be leaving, before I announce it, uh, she, she's going to be leaving uh, Southern California for Colorado. She's retiring, and she's got it all figured out, and we just wish her well. And if for any reason the winds blow uh, you know, west again, may you come back, Wendy, because you're young, you're energetic. I think you're way too early to retire, way too young, and you've just um, you know, done so much. As a matter of fact, you've done so much, you have a whole second page here. Um, and, but it talks about what I just said, that you're going to Colorado. So um, please say a few words and I'll present you the city tile. Um, I want to thank uh, the mayor and the council and everyone so much. Um, Santa Ana has been very good to me and my family. My, my children are still here and my grandkids are here, so I will be visiting often enough. 
Um, I enjoyed so much serving the city um, on the cable board and the park and rec board. Um, but I am going to be 62 in October, and it is time to retire. <laughs> so um, we're off to Colorado, which is kind of like a second home. And um, I know that I will find a place there, I hope, and where I live to be able to still serve the new city that I'll be, that I'll be living in. Um, but this is a wonderful place, and I wish everyone in this city and around in our county the best, the best life health and happiness for all of you all. Wendy, this is a, a, a city tile. Um, it's got obviously the Orange County seat of government and also the Golden City founded in 1869 and through those years many people have come and gone but you've been extraordinary. You've done a lot for this community and it's my honor, privilege, and pleasure to present this to you. Thank you, Wendy. Take care. Wendy. Now I want to recognize Chaplain uh, Charlotte Drew for her outstanding service to the community. If Chaplain is here, please come on down and walk around. This is... Um, this is uh, Charlotte, but it's got a nest. Yes. Okay. And she's a native of Santa Ana. Uh, her heart and passion for the homeless community uh, is tremendous, and she's worked for them for over 15 years. She serves as a chaplain at the Orange County Women's Jail. Uh, chaplain Charlotte is determined to do all she can to help restore dignity and respect to homeless families, especially women and children throughout Orange County. She strongly believes that in spite of the homelessness or incarceration, they're still, they still matter greatly. They have value and worth, and their quality of life can be a reality once again. Today, Chaplain Drew directs the Just uh, Jesus Ministries, which she founded in 1999. The ministry feeds and provides personal needs for the homeless. Chaplain Drew began the um, Intercessors Conference in 2011 and is a fervent uh, intercessor herself who believes that prayer and intercession can become a priority in every Christian's life. Um, she served uh, on the Mayor's Prayers Breakfast Committee. Um, also in the past, also in 2002, she received a committee recognition and certificate by the Orange County Rescue Mission, and also by the state of California. Uh, in 2012, she received recognition from the California state legislators and Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Chaplain Drew uh, has uh, been a guest speaker at previous, uh, many prisons and correctional facilities. She's made great guest appearances on various Christian TV talk shows. Uh, she's written a book entitled Matthew 25 Project, this book is a manual containing instructions on working with the homeless and the jail ministry. It also contains a, a very raw testimony of her journey from that of a young girl and her call to follow Jesus. Uh, this book has encouraged uh, uh, many people to follow God and to become faithful. Um, and uh, she's uh, reached out to all of them and, and uh, helped them through her prayer. So... Before I present you this, uh, Chaplain, uh, surely you give speeches and everything. I know you want to say a few words, yes? Okay. Please. So I'm grateful for this opportunity, and I do thank Jesus. And I just got awarded in February the Tom Mesero Humanitarian Award. And so I'm grateful to have this opportunity and also a time that I'll be emailing to sit down. And I have a proposal for the homeless that I know will work. 
I don't know if you saw her energy, but she's got a lot of energy. And then when she had that proposal that, you know, will work, she was looking straight at me. Um, kind of like that movie. Have you ever seen uh, Lilies of the Field with Sidney Poitier? There's a scene where he's talking to the Mother Superior, and she says, I want you to build me a chapel. And he says, well, you know, insurance. And he goes like this. You were looking at me that way. Um, <laughs> So, so um, uh, Chaplain uh, Drew, this is a, a certificate of recognition, recognizing you for your outstanding contributions to the homeless of our community and beyond, because I know you help beyond as well. So, you know, it's dated this 20 day th uh, 20th day of June 2017, and it's my honor and pleasure to present it to you. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez is next. And then Councilmember Solario, if you can be on bat in the batter's box or whatever. Thank you, Mayor Polito. If I can please have Helen Sullivan please join me, the President and CEO of Neighborhood Works in Orange County. So today I am doing a proclamation um, in recognition of National Home Ownership Month. How are you? And I think this is always a a great proclamation to give, and I think it's one of our first to be do, uh, doing this here in the city of Santa Ana. National Home Ownership Month was created during President Bill Clinton's administration in 1995 as a week-long celebration of home ownership. In, in 2002, President George W. Bush proclaimed the entire month of June as National Home Ownership Month. Many Americans and young families are not confident that they will ever own a home because they are having difficulty saving money for a down payment. Here, I like to call the city of Santa Ana the millennial city of America. When you look at the uh, per capita of, of 100,000 of cities above, Santa Ana's medium age is 29.9 years of age. We are the youngest city in Orange County and certainly of cities over 100,000. And so as I look at the young families here in the city of Santa Ana, it's certainly a hope and a dream of theirs to hopefully one day own a home in the city of Santa Ana. But unfortunately, unfortunately, here in Orange County, it's kind of out of their reach. And so this is why it's so important for us, one, to advocate. And I'm not going to go um, on the rest on, on what they put here for me, because I would like for you, Helen, to really speak about the program with Neighborhood Works of Orange County and what you all have done to help families here, not only in Orange County, but here in the city of Santa Ana. And how can we continue to promote here in the city of Santa Ana uh, folks to continue to purchase homes and to live that American dream that many once in this community had for, so, for such a long time that now this future generation is unable to attain. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be able to stand up here today and talk a little bit about what NeighborWorks Orange County is doing and what we've done for the last 40 years. We're in our 40th year of uh, providing home ownership counseling, education, and down payment assistance to families throughout Orange County. Last year, I'm very proud to say that we helped 27 families in Santa Ana not just Orange County, just Santa Ana, achieve first-time home ownership. And let me tell you, that doesn't sound like a big number, but it's huge considering, as we were just hearing, the high cost of housing. In Orange County, it's over $700,000 for the median price of a home, and that is not matched by the income level of not only millennials, but just the average income uh, level of folks in Orange County. So what we try and do is give people hope through providing education, and that can be financial education, telling you how to save and how to uh, prepare yourself credit-wise and, and give you some pointers on how to shop wisely for a home that you can afford, because that is what we truly want, is to get people into homes that they can afford. And we're so happy that, like I said, this last year, just in the past four quarters, 27 more people are there, and we have hundreds more that are in our home buyer club right now that are in the process of saving money, 
and uh, improving their credit and building their um, wish list of things that they want to do, like reduce debt. So anybody here who wants to have a home can have a home, and I really hope that you uh, call us if there's anything that we can do to help you get there. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. And it's just exciting to hear that 27 people, and certainly that is a big number base. It's really a big number for us here in the city of Santa Ana and wanting to thank you. And also wanting just to address and thank our staff. We have a, a first time home buyer program, and certainly that we've been marketing out in our community. So I see them out there in the front and wanting to thank you all. And hopefully we can continue to partner up. And I know you all have been working with our city uh, staff, but it's always important to making sure that we do have those partners partnerships and, and 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 our city staff have been doing a, a good job and Jud Judson over there is just shaking his head and um, it, it's fantastic that we can partner with you so whatever we can continue to do to promote um, you know um, uh, residents to, to, to one you know be um, how to save money number two how to work with folks like yourselves to help get there and then number three if the city continues to have its home ownership program how can we get them eligible to participate um, I think it's very important that we leverage our resources with one another so that we can help families um, have ownership in the city of Santa Ana. I'm not going to read all the whereas's, but I will uh, do the whereas. Owning a home is part of the American dream. A home provides shelter and a safe place where families can prosper and children can thrive. It is with a great source of personal pride and important part of our community stability. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and the entire city council hereby proclaim National Home Ownership Month. And I, I just really hope and encourage residents to learn more about financial financial management and to explore home ownership opportunities dated today June 20th 2017 thank you very much thank you so much of course you take a Good evening. I'd like to bring up uh, the Comlink board members. Uh, I think many in the audience know that you know these past several months I've been recognizing uh, some of our outstanding neighborhood associations and their leaders. And to have you know good leaders and different associations, you also need a good leadership team uh, at the hub, and that's what the Comlink uh, board is. And they help keep our city nice, beautiful, and the leaders organized. Let's give them a round of applause. Comlink, which is uh, you know the informal name for the Santa Ana Communication Linkage Forum, is a voluntary neighborhood resident organization formed in July 1989, so some decades ago, for the purpose of providing a nonpartisan forum to promote the exchange of public policy ideas and information between neighborhoods and community leaders. Comlink partners with the city in order to communicate the positive aspects of Santa Ana and to enhance a sense of community. Comlink originally started just with five neighborhood associations, uh, but we actually now have 64 uh, recognized neighborhood associations citywide. Uh, the forum also strives to promote positive leadership, community participation, unity and pride in all neighborhoods by improving the quality, quality of life, block by block, uh, they like to say. Uh, behind me are, are, are the, the uh, members of the board. We have Peter Katz of the Marless Neighborhood. He's the president. Uh, Evangeline Goronsky of Wilshire Square Neighborhood is the vice president. And we have board members Irma Macias of the Miss City Neighborhood, Ed Marashi of the Flora Park Neighborhood, Terry McCall of Casa de Santiago Neighborhood, and Carl Benninger of Metro Classic Neighborhood. Uh, they're doing really great, and uh, we want to generally invite folks to an event coming up later this month on Thursday, June 22nd from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Bowers. Uh, the Comlink Board will celebrate the 30th Annual Most Beautiful Yard Contest, a program to create set to, to, to motivate residents to you know, improve their, their yards and their landscaping. Uh, this year was the highest participation rate ever. Uh, they're really excited that 27 neighborhood associations each did a contest and submitted uh, uh, Most Beautiful Yard winner uh, to be recognized in their neighborhood and citywide. Uh, also on the 22nd, they will celebrate the 21st Annual Neighborhood Hero Award. 
uh, which established which is established to honor the individuals who have shown commitment and enthusiasm in bettering the quality of life in their neighborhoods. Uh, and this year, they are recognizing 16 uh, neighborhood heroes. Uh, let's congratulate on behalf of the city, uh, the Comlink Board, for their great commitment to our city and strengthening neighborhoods. And, and before we give out the awards, I'd like the president uh, to, to say a few words, please. Yes, without everybody out here, it wouldn't be possible. We have over 65% of our neighborhoods participate on a regular basis uh, in Comlink. And this year we've added, uh, uh, it'll be our second annual William Edward Branch, the third Humanitarian Spirit Award for the most outstanding citizens contribution uh, to helping make this a great city. So uh, this is a great annual event for uh, our neighborhoods. And, and this is how we build our city, block by block, house by house, working together. So uh, you're all welcome. Thank you. Peter, by the way, he's shy and, and, and humble, but he, he also served us. He's a veteran uh, and is one of our great leaders, and I know he's working very hard for that Orange County Cemetery at the Great Park. So thank you for your service to our country and for your service to Comlink and this great city. Congratulations. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, of heroes, with our Artist Village, we also have a lot of artistic uh, leaders. And so I want to recognize and bring on up uh, Dino Perez. Please come on up. Let's give him a big round of applause. Dino was born and raised in Santa Ana, so he's a homegrown leader, uh, and he currently lives in the Grand Central Art Center, right in the, right in the heart of it all, in the, in the artist village. Uh, he has a Bachelor's of Science degree in graphic design, and is a graphic designer who also illustrates and paints. Uh, he carries his sketchbook wherever he goes, uh, and I'm sure he has one here you know, in the audience with him. Uh, Dino has participated in the Santa Ana Art Walk since 2010, you know, the first Saturday of the month. You know, big crowds come out to see the artists, to see uh, and hear all the, all the great uh, performances that are out there. Uh, he has painted a utility box for the city of Santa Ana, and you can see it on the corner of 4th and Bush as part of the utility box art pilot program, so he can get, help the city get that off the ground uh, through community engagement and the residency at Grand Central, Dino has also worked directly with the community in the Lacey neighborhood. Uh, he creates coloring pages and hosts monthly coloring events for residents of the Triada in the Lacey neighborhood, where there's an average of 80 to 120 residents per event. So that's a fantastic turnout. Uh, this allows him to mentor, mentor young um, young individuals in the neighborhood, and you know, Santa Ana is the youngest city, city in the country based on median age, so we thank you for mentoring our, our young people. Uh, Dino has also mentored the Creative Leaders of Santa Ana, a group of high school students at Santa Ana High who meet regularly at the Grand Central Art Center. Uh, there he has helped students produce other uh, coloring books based on their experiences uh, in Santa Ana. Uh, lastly, you know, OC Weekly you know, is a popular you know, publication in Orange County, and he was recently recognized as Best Artist uh, for OC Weekly's Artopia for the Utility Box Project that he completed. Congratulations on behalf of the City of Santa Ana. Um, thank you, Council Member Solorio. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polito, and thank you to the Santa Ana City Council Members. I'm deeply honored to receive this certificate of recognition, uh, recognition. I could not have done it without the love and support from my parents, who nurtured, uh, nourished my passion for art at a very early age. I would also like to thank my family, my fiance Jane, my friends, and my community for the constant support. I would not be able to do what I do without the support that I have received from the city of Santa Ana. 
Um, like Councilmember Solorio said, I've been a part of the Santa Ana Art Walk since 2010. And in 2015, Downtown Inc. supported my vision for my Coloring with the Community project. And I thank them for that and for the support throughout the years. I would also like to thank Community Engagement and Grand Central Art Center, where I'm an artist in residence, for welcoming Coloring with the Community with open arms and support. Thank you. Thank you again. Councilmember Villegas. Good evening, everyone. If I can have the gentleman from Hybrid Studios come forth, Mr. Uh, Billy Klein and Patrick Omenick. Welcome. On behalf of the city of Santa Ana, I want to recognize these fine gentlemen and their uh, production uh, recording studio, Harvard uh, Studios, for the great work that they do. I, uh, I, I was looking at the list, but that list is long with all the artists that you work with. So I'm going to let you talk about that. I, I was very, very impressed. I think you should be recognized for your, the good work that you gentlemen do and for the recognition that you bring to the city of Santa Ana. Even one of the uh, Grammy Award winner, uh, Conjunto Primavera, you guys for doing so. I know you guys have to be a little quiet Very about good. some of the artists you work with. Uh, the, you know, they require uh, uh, some uh, privacy. But uh, I was just so, so impressed. And uh, if you can tell us a little bit about your, uh, about the work and uh, why you chose to bring the studio to Santa Ana, it would be, be great. Yeah, Thank you. I'm a little tall. All right, well, first off, uh, on behalf of Billy and I and the rest of the team at Hybrid Studios, we want to thank Councilmember Viegas, the mayor, and the rest of the council members here, and uh, the people of Santa Ana. Um, it's uh, been a long journey for us. We, um, we started this dream back in, right after middle school, actually. We built a recording studio in our, my mom's uh, one-car garage. And uh, after many, many years working on projects and uh, going to school, growing our skills and knowledge, uh, we finally, just a couple years ago, were able to uh, build our own dream multimedia production facility. Um, it uh, houses a massive sound stage that is used for film and photography. We have a recording, couple recording studios um, for tracking, mixing, and mastering of music, audiobooks, voiceovers, podcasts. Um, but yeah, we're very happy to be in the city of Santa Ana, um, one of the very few cities that has. Uh, uh, helped out with all the local music and creative arts community. Uh, so we thank you for that, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. On, on behalf of City of Santa Ana, we recognize you today. If we can get a picture. Madam uh, City Attorney, is there anything to report out of closed session? Mayor, we do have two reportable items on the um, items regarding existing litigation in the case of Tony Camargo versus the City of Santa Ana. The City Council voted 5-0 with um, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, Mayor um, Polito, Mr. Sarmiento, Viegas, and Solario, approving a settlement of $225,000. In the case of um, Philip Van Berkwerk, City of Santa Ana. In that case, the council approved a settlement of thirty thousand dollars by a four to, to a zero vote with count, with Mayor Polito abstaining. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, consent calendar. But before I do that, let me just uh, read a script saying that there might be a teleconference coming in. I believe that uh, Councilmember Saltina Head is going to be calling in. So don't do it now, just hold off. He better phone in. Um, all right. So with that, um, uh, any items on the consent calendar that wish to be pulled, Mayor Pro Tem? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, you're going to have to bear with me. This is a very long agenda. Lot. It's very crammed up because we continue many items, as we all know that. So I have many items that I will be Go ahead. Uh, pulling 20A, 23A, 
25 F, 25 G, 25 J, and I'm a no vote on 31 um, B. Well, I guess we'll just do that when they come. I don't want to confuse you. I'm a no vote on Fine. two. Fine. All right. Um, why don't I entertain a motion? Are there other items to be pulled or abstained on? Mr. Mayor, did you call 20 A? I, I believe that's yes. going to be pulled. So I would entertain a motion on the balance of the consent calendar. So, so moved. moved. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 20A, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> yes, Mr. Mayor, I know this item is uh, Councilman Sarmiento's, but I have a question more from a um, appropriations. And so I have asked a lot of budget questions, and he wasn't present, and I know we were moving this over. Um, and this is uh, recognizing 65000 from the clerk of the council's um, office. Was, were these funds um, separated from the 27 or $29 million uh, that we had of additional funds that were put in, into her um, uh, department? These are... Are those funds, uh, I guess, the, the, the surplus funds? Th these funds are in this year's budget. They're in a line item that was not expended. If you make the appropriation tonight, you are drawing money from this year's budget this year's as if budget. you're, yes, mm -hmm. you're spending it. If you don't make the appropriation tonight, the money will roll over because the fiscal year closes. And then we would look at it as an appropriation in next year's budget. We do have one-time funds. Yes. Uh, correct. And correct. so I just, um, I just wanted to make that very clear versus her possibly needing those monies for her uh, position, right? So that she is currently correct. has um, in that department. So that was just my question from a, budget, a budgetary standpoint, where we're at today versus uh, one-time funds for this fiscal year. Do you want to move approval? And prior. No, I think Councilman um, Go ahead. has questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I believe that um, the preferences of those that are supportive of this is for us to put this matter over just because we need the full council to be here as well. And the funds obviously so is that a don't motion get for a continuance? It's a motion to continue to the next meeting. Is there a second? I'll second it. Those in favor, favor. please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. I think it was unanimous, but, but it was a very quiet unanimous. Yeah, I, I, I had some questions. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, if, if, if you don't mind. Uh, so back to, we know the source of the funds is the clerk's office, apparently in a, in a salary account. So if we don't do anything before the end of the fiscal year, because that's coming up, it automatically rolls over? Did it, I, did I, it, I, well, it would no longer be available in this year's budget. It would be available for the council to appropriate next year. The money just... Uh, the, the so for the next fiscal year's budget, there's the same exact line item with... No, it's 65. not in the budget. We would have to go in and do a special appropriation. It's money that was not appropriated okay. that would be in the ending fund balance. So, so, so it would be a new, entirely new um, budget item, and where would the source of money come from next year if it wasn't in the... It's still the same budget. money. It's money in this year's budget that didn't get spent, okay. that goes into ending fund balance, and we simply would add it to the budget appropriation for so next year. So we have year. a positive fund yes. balance for this year, so we would come from... Mm -hmm. that 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 fund balance okay Correct. fair enough thank you all right motion had previously passed and so with that next item mayor thank pro you, uh, mr mayor the next item is uh 23 a um and that is um to award contract to the los angeles engineering inc for construction on bristol improvements water main and sewer main improvements from washington to 17th street if i could have staff please approach on this issue and so what we're going to do in a tune of over $4 million is going to be spent to making improvements to our uh, water main and our sewer mains. The question I had for you, Mr. Mossifor, uh, Fred, is have we done any reconstruction on that street? Already? Have we done any kind of reconstruction on that street? No. No. Recently, you mean? So recently we have recently. not. Say, how about over the past two years? They are not. I, I believe the the the, the uh, resurfacing works was was done uh, five year, more than five years ago. Okay. I believe. 
are we going to be doing any kind of other street repairs or repaving or anything of the sort? And the reason why I pulled this item, because I think I've spoken about this in the, in the past, about wanting to make sure that we leverage our funding. If we're going to be, you know, reconstructing our street, it's only in the best interest that we do our sewer mains and our water mains, because what we don't want to do, and I think we have done this in the past, is that we'll reconstruct a whole new road, and then we have to put a sewer main and a water main, and then we go back again and re de de deconstruct that road it causes congestion problems you know the I think many of our, our members of our community kind of get frustrated because it kind of goes out for five to six months and so I'm just wanting to make sure that if we are going to have any other additional infrastructure that we do it at the same time because this is a huge investment that we are making and that again is uh, making improvements to our water main system and our sewer um, improvements and so I definitely support the item just want to make sure that we're not doing any kind of other uh, construction and not taking this into account. Thank you. We're very well aware of that, and we make sure that we don't do duplicate work. Fantastic. Thank you, Mayor. Move this item. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those opposed, motion carries. The next item 25 is F. 25F, which is an agreement with um, Miller Mando for police department and background. Um, if actually it's 25F and 25G, I don't know if we have our acting uh, police chief here or someone from our police department, they could help us. Um, and I see Mr. Carroll. Um, Mr. Carroll, on 25F, and, and I think these are great items, 25S is an agreement with Miller Mendo for police department background software. I guess based on the report, um, last year you guys used their software and it was very successful. Correct. And so now you all are you know, wanting to move forward with this software, but I did see a huge contingency of about five million dollars in the program is only going to cost fifty thousand, or am I mistaken? No, the, where, where's the, the contingency was uh, five thousand nine hundred eighty-five dollars and, and ah, fifty cents. Okay. It's the uh, yeah, okay, almost six thousand dollars. Six thousand, and so this whole thing is going to cost about fifty thousand over a three-year period. Correct. Over a three-year period, and is the majority of that? Is it because of the storage? Uh, no, what we do is we fees? buy we buy um, entries into the software system mm -hmm. about 315 a year, and uh, that's the majority of the cost. And there is a minimal storage fee as well. Okay, and then just as we are, as we are, we're moving forward with adding new software across the entire city. We have Jack Chola here wanting to make sure that we are in communication in regards to our systems and what we're doing moving forward. Um, I think it's important that we have a comprehensive plan as we're definitely moving, um, you know, the police department into the 21st century as it pertains to technology and data to making sure that you guys get your jobs done quicker, faster, and more efficient and, and much easier. Um, and so I'm excited about 25F that you are, are moving in that direction I think is one that should have happened uh, quite some time ago to help alleviate um, some of the problems and definitely the the amount of backgrounds that you all are doing is is, is extensive and 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 many of them so I, I support this item mr. mayor is there a second those in favor please say aye aye, aye. Aye, those opposed. Motion carries and, unanimously. And Next. Similar question is 25G. It's agreement with Linear Systems for an annual maintenance and support of the police uh, digital imaging system. So on this item here, I just, um, you know, wanted to make sure that as we move forward, again, um, I, I do see that it's not going to exceed $33,000. We have a 10000 contingency fund. Are, th are these uh, firms that you all are working for, do they only specifically deal with with law enforcement um, because again as we're moving forward with lots of software and trying to do integration with our systems I'm wanting to make sure that you know we're we're able to do it in, 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 a, in, in a fashion where we're getting our best bang uh, for our buck but at the same time being able to connect our systems and so um, I'm not sure um, Jack and, and, and this is what are they the only ones that are doing imaging or the rest, uh, do we have other departments in the city that are also doing this as well? And, and, are, we using, uh, and are we using multiple companies? Yeah, for this system here, this system, uh, Lanier system, it, uh, it's proprietary. So they're the only ones that can provide support for this system. Uh, it's only a one-year agreement because the, there's the potential that the, the integrated software project that we're currently working on with Jack and his staff as well, okay. they're very involved that there's a potential that that system will replace this system. Ah, That's why we're only okay. going with a one-year agreement, so. 
Fantastic. We'll know, we'll know and more in a few months. Will we be going out for an RFP after this one year um, is over, or will we continue to possibly um, do uh, um, business with this firm? This, if it, if the new integrated software does not replace the system, we have a couple of one-year options in here. Okay. Uh, so we'll we'll know more in a few months. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and I'm glad that you all are working together. We're moving forward towards a more integrated system that I Definitely. think um, um, and, and many times we don't realize within city government, sometimes our systems are not communicating with one another. So it makes our jobs a little bit more difficult. And so now we're moving towards a towards systems that are going to integrate our system. So that is that like we city council members sometimes? I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything, Mayor. All I'm right. not going to say anything. I'm going to be nice. So, right. But I move this item forward. Is there a second? Second. Everybody awake? <laughs> All right. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries. Is it 25J or what? Um, the next, next item, Mr. Mayor, is yes, 25J. And this is um, the tenant interest purchase agreement for Bristol, and I'm just a no vote on that. All right. Thank I you. want to entertain a motion. <laughs> we have a motion, a second. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, there's one no, and motion passes. And my last item is 31B, Mayor, and just consistency with the conditional use permit as it pertains to wire uh, uh, foot uh, facilities. I am not in favor uh, of these. For one, for various reasons, um, we still have a lot of these facilities that are not retrofitted. I know the new ones that are coming in are retrofitted, but I think it, it, it's a, our responsibility to making sure that the entire system is retrofitted. And I certainly understand that the cost um, for these utility for these companies is significant but I think our residents deserve to have a system that is retrofitted so when we do have a major earthquake we are prepared for that and they are um, our major uh, wireless facility uh, and companies that are really in many respects not wanting to do that but they're doing the the, the new systems um, with um, with uh, retrofit so so you're no vote on I'm that a no vote on 31 is there a motion we have a motion Seconds. and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, one no. Motion passes. Item 50A, this is an amendment to the Youth Commission compensation. Who would like to move this item? Uh, move it. Mr. Mayor, that we have some options that um, before Go we ahead. move. Um, I'm good. Um, I had a question maybe for our city staff. Um, as it pertains, you know, I would like to go with option two, which is compensate regular uh, member $50, alternate members 25 But I, I had a question as it pertains to associate members. Do those associate members attend the meetings all the time, or do they only come when the alternate member is unable to attend? They are technically required to be there. They're not voting members, and currently the compensation is $10 per meeting. So what we would do is um, give the associate member ten dollars. So that wasn't there. So the reg compensate the regular member fifty dollars. The alternate, uh, al alternate alternate member twenty five, and then the associate member ten dollars. And so I think that that is a, a, a fair. Um, and so I will move the item for option I'll two. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and the general public five dollars. <laughs> okay. I just may I clarify? May I clarify? Just to stay for the record. Question. Yeah. Mayor President, just may I clarify, you're choosing option two, but you are changing yeah, it she's to say amending it. $10 for associate members. Correct. I just want to make that clear. Correct. Correct. Thank you. We'll make that change. Yes. So and just we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed. Motion carries. Now I believe we're on 55A. I would entertain a motion. Um, Mr. Mayor, on um, 55A, a, I just want to make sure that what we're doing is just clarifying it's on, on the uh, tax revenues that we receive from the city, um, just to uh, just state to, uh, for the that public. That's what we're doing. it's a limited limit. It's a li yes, yes, it's a limit. It's a limited yes. limit. Mm -hmm. And mo I'll move the item forward. Well, we had a motion already, oh, so second. you can second it. Okay. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Now, here's what you want to note on. Oh, that's good. You can no, do I'm it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, we'll do you're, it. you're the I'll League of California Cities voting delegate. I'll move I'll, it. I'll make a motion to um, make Mayor Polito. No, I, he's not available. <laughs> he's not available. So, um, so but, I, but he understands that Mayor Pro Tem is available. Yeah, <laughs> All right, so the motion is Michelle wants to attend more oh, meetings. So God. moved. And there's second. a second. Those in favor? Motion carries with Michelle being a no vote. No, I'm kidding. She yes. didn't say that. Okay, next item. 
um, authorize initiation of a new solid waste servicing contract process and amend and restate existing solid waste agreement. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes. May I speak? Yes. Uh, I, uh, have a, I'm going to remove myself, recruit myself uh, from this item uh, as I have a potential conflict with my husband working for a company that represents a, uh, a waste company. So I will be leaving the room, but staff is here and certainly uh, ready to answer any of your Thank questions. Thank you for that disclosure. Uh, let me first uh, entertain uh, people from the audience that wish to address us. Uh, Chip Moreno. No, maybe it's Monaco. Monaco. Sorry, the, the A and the R look like an R, the A and the C. And then George Urch and Jeff Snow. Go ahead, Chip. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. It's a privilege to be here this evening, and it's certainly a privilege to serve your residents and your businesses in your city every single day. As you know, Waste Management hosts one of its offices and hauling facilities in this great city, and there are 119 employees that work out of that facility, of which 78 are proud residents of this great city. That's 65% of our workforce that live and work right here for, for this city. A great number of those employees have been driving and serving the residents of your city for over 20 years in the very neighborhoods in which they live in. It's, it's a true honor, it's a true privilege, um, and, and it's something we're very proud of. I've read the staff report this evening and I believe strongly that any negotiation related to this type of extension should allow the elements to drive the negotiation, not the term to drive the negotiation. And that's a really important distinction. If you put forward a specific term, it changes the way in which we approach the negotiation. If you leave the term flexible, it gives both parties to bring elements to the table that would allow us to drive uh, a, a mutually beneficial opportunity um, and have the term come out of those discussions. It's important to waste management that we continue to serve in this city. It's important that we continue to provide great service to your residents and businesses. And we believe that a negotiation that focuses on the elements of an extension, again, and not the term, would be best for all parties involved. And I thank you again for your time tonight. Go ahead, Mr. Urch. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. George Urch, representing the uh, Wear Disposal this evening. I'd like to praise uh, Public Works Agency staff for their hard work on this item. It's not an easy one, and they've been working very hard for a long period of time to try to bring it forward. Would like to urge a yes vote where Disposal and Madison Materials are very happy to serve the city of Santa Ana and its residents. We're excited the fact that uh, you guys are moving forward on the item and just like to urge a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Snow. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Polito, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, and esteemed members of the City Council of Santa Ana. My name is Jeff Snow. I represent Republic Services, America's preferred recycling and solid waste partner. We support item 65B in its entirety. Believe that over two years uh, timeline to manage a comprehensive RFP will help the city make the best decision. Republic Services is excited to share our proposal and ideas for enhanced sustainability, community partnerships through our Neighborhood Promise Program, and believe that we can help make Santa Ana one of the greenest cities in America. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now let me bring it uh, to Council for thought and discussion. Who would like to begin? Councilor Sarmiento, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I uh, wanted to see if staff could come up. Um, I just had a few questions on this and some clarification on the staff recommendation as well. Fred, if you can, give, give me a little bit of background or for the public's benefit, some background on how long it's been that um, we've reviewed this contract for haulers in the city. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. This uh, contract has been in effect since 1993, uh, almost 24 years. Uh, we've had a number of uh, amendments and extension throughout the years, and uh, here we are. Right. And I, you know, if memory serves, I think we were, we've retained or, or had a consultant that was retained by the staff to help 
procure um, some proposals for additional haulers or, 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 or other haulers. And maybe you can just refresh our memories on, on, um, on, that, um, on that consultant that we had retained previously. Uh, you're you referring to the consultant that we hired right. to help us through the transition? Right, right. Yes, we, we went in March of 2015, we started the process of um, uh, hiring a consultant expert in the field that have substantial experience both in public and private side to help us through the, through the transition process. Um, the company is, was hired, uh, uh, Sloan McAfee, uh, and they have been helping us in um, basically getting the comparison between what we have and what other agencies have in, in, uh, in Orange County, what's the price differences, apple to apple comparison, and they're going to support and help us in, in, in a process of drafting the RFP, uh, going through the negotiation uh, for the extension, and also uh, providing a proposal to the council of what, what the staff would recommend. And what's your estimate for a proposal uh, being circulated and kind of hitting the streets for applicants to respond to? What's, what's the timeline that you estimate? The experts are um, stating that the process would, would take a, a, at least 15 to 18 months uh, from, from the day that we, the council authorized us to go through the, to the RFP process. And uh, um, that, that's the time it will take to uh, generate the RF, RFP, float the RFP, and also award the contract and allow time for the, for the contractor uh, to um, purchase all the equipment, material, what they need to, to serve the city of this size. So 15 to 18 months from the time that the RFP is drafted to the point that some um, uh, bidder or bidders are selected? Uh, no, uh, it would take about six months, six to six to eight months to float the RFP and select the uh, contract. It will take about nine to 12 months for a contractor that is selected to get ready because they have to uh, order thousands of bins and the trucks and whatever it takes to, to service the city of this. So the selection process isn't the 15 or 18 months. You're, you're talking about the, 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 the prevailing um, bidder to go out and hit the streets and be ready to do some hauling. Exactly. Okay. To, to implement a new, um, from the start of the RFP process to actually uh, implement the um, process of new, new contract to get in place and getting, getting the work started would be at least 15 to 18 months. Got it. The only, the only clarifications, and I'm not sure if, it's, if um, we have somebody um, on behalf of the city manager's office, but um, maybe you, uh, Madam City Attorney, can go ahead and gather some of the information or comments that we're going to make. But one of the things I think that wasn't clear is that um, I think, you know, Waste has done a great job in the city. I think that they've been a good partner, um, you know, with the city. Um, but we do have some other haulers that do some good work with us as well, which is Madison and Ware. So I think that it would be um, correct and consistent for us to extend uh, contracts that we have with um, that carrier or those carriers for the same period of time that we do for waste. And I think the staff's recommendation is for a one-year extension. And I think that'll give you some time as well to prepare the RFP, um, procure it, uh, make the selection, and, um, and give you some time to maybe bring that, um, that you know, new um, hauler or haulers. Because I know other cities our size, they don't have a single hauler. They have multiple haulers, right? And they break it up into regions and, and and um, they found some efficiencies and some economies of scale uh, on that as well. Um, so that would be my, th those would be my two clarifications, Madam City Attorney, that if we, if we extend by the year, uh, by one year for waste, we do it uh, for the other two haulers as well. That's the first one. And the second one would be. By the way, um, in Council, I'm sorry to interrupt. That, that is our recommendation. And that's yeah, but it's just not worded point. clearly, so let me just make sure that okay. it's on the record that it is, it is clear. And then the um, other one is on number two, the, that the direction to staff to initiate the request for proposal um, gets done concurrently and, and it begins you know, now upon approval of the, of, the, of the council items or the agenda items. So those would be my just clarifications on a motion that probably incorporates those two references. And, and we have more Mr. comments. So let's take additional comment first. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, then I'll go to the left. Mayor, and, and, and I'm in agreement uh, with Councilman Sarmiento, but let me tell you why I think we need to uh, 
start this RFP process now, and nothing against waste management. And I've talked about the violation of Proposition 218 month after month after month. There's a 30% surcharge that is not being charged to our waste haulers. It's being charged to the residents and business community of Santa Ana. And my question is to our staff, it is being transferred to the general fund? How is that money being spent? When I say 30%, this is 12 to $15 million, ladies and gentlemen. This is why I'm asking it to go to RFP process now. We are in violation. And if we want to start this program that our public works director wants to start, which is the START program, here we are going to impose another surcharge, certainly to, to our waste haulers and other folks. But guess what? Typically when you, you know, create these fees to these companies, guess what? That cost ends up going towards the residents and they have to pay more. So not, all, not only you know, are they already paying 30% surcharge, we're now trying to wanting to move forward and I know Councilman Solorio is trying to push to do this smart and so am I because it generates additional revenue. But at the expense of who? When we talk about our values, we talk about supporting the residents of this community and the businesses of this community, they are paying way over the amount they should be, and not only that, that it's not going, and it's not, and I'm certainly it's not waste management's fault, and I do want to clarify that. What, what I'm saying here today, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do, and it's the right thing to do, and it is my hope that my colleagues know that because I've put you all on notice, I've put our staff on notice, and let me tell you, this is a crime. You can go to jail. And I know that our city staff is working on doing a study, but I have to put you all on notice publicly again. Because what we're, we're doing to this community is wrong. And if we're going to want to continue to do a program like our public works director that's very innovative and is fi figuring out ways of how do we fund our Vision Zero and our streets, we can't continue to do it on the backs of people and charging them over and beyond what they're supposed to be paying. So this is why I'm asking to do an RFP process now while we're doing this study so that we can solve this problem and that I can support Fred and his innovation and what he's trying to do. He's trying to do the right thing. But again, we have a responsibility to the residents and business community to follow the law. That's all I'm asking up here. Let's follow the law and let's do things right. It's time. Thank you. Let's go, Councilmember Solorio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just just a couple questions here. Uh, but but first, uh, just to follow up on what the Councilwoman w w was talking about. I know that this past year and really b before that, we've been trying to identify you know really enterprise funds that should stay within their enterprise rather than, you know, finding themselves supporting uh, items in the general fund that may s seem a little bit linked but not really as linked to the enterprise fund where, uh, where it makes a better sense and, you know, a legal sense. Um, it, you know, it's, it's my understanding that through one of the uh, items in this recommendation, which is uh, to approve an amended and restated agreement, that uh, by doing that, we'd be addressing the possible uh, issue with respect to Prop 218 that I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez is in part talking about that. Can we have either uh, our director or city attorney speak to uh, whether the, the amendment and restatement of the agreement would uh, address that possible Prop 218 issue? Yeah, um, Councilmember Solario, I'd be happy to address that, although I have advised the city on these issues in closed session. I'd prefer not to discuss those issues um, in open session. I do think that restating the agreement at the very least combines each and every one of the charges which have previously been set forth as resolutions or taken it as minute order actions. So I do believe that at least having a restated agreement where we can find the franchise fee um, is, is more transparent. Obviously, it's being discussed this evening, and it's the right thing to do. Um, and as to any potential liability, I'd prefer to discuss that in a right, closed session right. environment. And, you know, and I know that outside of the closed session environment, we've had a general discussion about what this amendment does, which is why in our public agenda. So 
uh, I do want to thank uh, your office for trying to uh, improve the issues that I think uh, are in place, and so that's another reason why we do need to move on, you know, some set of actions uh, t today. Um, with respect to the, 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 the RFP, I think it makes sense to begin the RFP sooner than later, you know, now or after the 90-day negotiation period that, that staff's recommending, so I don't have an issue, issue there. Where I do have a question is on what range of options we should consider for the extension. Uh, I know that um, staff over the past several months really has considered a variety of options and brought different recommendations to us. I know a prior recommendation was a two-year extension, and I think a member of the public also spoke of a, a, a two-year extension. Um, what have been the range of options that you've discussed, one year, two years, anything else that, that would make since you think during this 90-day uh, consideration period? Uh, our original uh, recommendation was to negotiate a short-term extension. Um, and um, as you know, the, you know, the change of administration and all of that, those mm -hmm. policies have changed. But I still uh, remain that we should have short-term extension. Um, we have here one year. But we, we, we're going to listen to uh, what base management has to say and what, what, what it works. And then whatever option that is feasible, we're going to bring to the council and uh, give you the chance to debate on it and uh, look at the pros and cons and then make a decision whether you want to have one year, uh, two years, or even more. Right. You know, and, and on that note, I mean, that's, that's what my thought is, that if we're going to direct staff to negotiate and to get the best deal for taxpayers, that you be able to analyze a range of options and then bring back, you know, any options you might recommend, whether it be one, two, five, seven, whatever might make sense. But I want what's going to be the best deal for the yes. taxpayer. And, you know, with that then is, you know, when it would go off to RFP. But since you are going to have really just – a relatively short period of time to negotiate something, you know, 90 days, and then you're going to come back to us. I'd rather be able to, for us and the public, look at the range of, of options rather than one, because I know even with the staff there's been uh, different thoughts of opinion on that. So, so that would be my preference, uh, you know, would be interested in what my other colleagues think, because I think uh, since you're going to have this limited period of time to negotiate, I'd rather empower you to figure out, is it, is it one year, 18 months? two years or some other extension period? Yeah, the, the philosophy behind one year was we need minimum one year to do the process of our RFP in a proper manner. Mm -hmm. That extension we need. So that's why we said one year extension. Right, so really that's more of a floor rather than a ceiling. But, but again, you know, I'd be interested in what my, my colleagues uh, think about that. Go ahead. Um, Juan, do you have any? Uh, Councilman Benavides? Thank you, Mayor. I apologize to council and the uh, public for my tardiness. My son was being uh, going through a promotion ceremony from elementary school to junior high today, so I couldn't miss that. Uh, I'm a proud dad uh, today. Uh, with regard to this item, a couple of questions uh, for staff, and this is one that has been uh, brought up for some time, and it's gone through a number of delays, delays and, and I know staff has worked on this has been uh, uh, looking forward to getting some type of direction from, from council, uh, right, so we can move forward. That window, that, that current uh, agreements, is, are, are, it's coming to a sunset, and so that window of trying to figure this out is, is coming to you know, a point where we absolutely have to make a decision so we can make sure to get the trash hauled and, and uh, take care of our, our residents, our community, our business community. Uh, with regard to the, the uh, what, one of the things that's been mentioned is this Smart Santana, right, which is uh, a proposal that's being brought forward by, uh, by Public Works, Director of Public Works uh, and his department, that would ultimately uh, ensure that the city has a system by which and, and resources by which we can uh, do that, the ongoing maintenance of our streets so that we don't have some streets end up with potholes, right, and end up deteriorating until we find funds at some point down the line. That would be a system by which we could uh, have a recurring uh, source of funds, uh, recognizing that some of the impact is the larger vehicles, uh, waste haul, uh, hauling vehicles being some of those, that uh, we have uh, the funds to be able to take care of our curbs and, and gutters and such, right, and, and be able to provide that maintenance. Um, with regard to 
extension, that's, that's, uh, as this has been brought forward, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's important to do what we can as a council to ensure that we are able to implement Smart Santana, uh, that, that, that uh, mechanism, that project. Um, with regard to the extension, how would that, what would the timeline impact be to being able to uh, launch that, uh, the Smart Santana program to be able to uh, recoup funds to be able to address uh, some of that, that uh, maintenance of our streets? It, it wouldn't uh, delay that process. In fact, we, we are uh, ready to bring the Smart Santana officially to, to council maybe in first session in August. Uh, and um, this restated contract would allow us to do that and be in compliance with 218 uh, and be able to move forward uh, from a funding standpoint. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't delay. It would be up to council to give us a direction to move forward. By the way, Smart Santa Ana is not only a uh, pavement management program. It, it makes the pave the remaining 40% of the streets within three to five years. Also make the program sustainable. Most importantly, it would generate uh, 14 to 17 million dollars to our Vision Zero program, which we have no funding for, and that would be reduction of, uh, you know, collisions involving pedestrian and, and bicyclists, and also would pump in a good sum of money into repair of our sidewalks and ADA ramps. It implements uh, the. Um, bicycle master, pl master plan within the three years on the city. So it, it, it would affect a lot of uh, transportation type project and sustainability within the city. So thank you for that. So I so, uh, want to echo some of what my, my colleagues have made reference to as we look at negotiation with uh, potential extension, as we look at RFP options, uh, I definitely would urge uh, staff to look at uh, anything with regard to uh, the, the, the Prop 218 issues and questions. I know that with the restated uh, agreement, that would be one step toward that, uh, which is item three uh, on, the, on the agenda here, recommendations. And then that other point that's been mentioned as far as ensuring that we get the best deal for, for the residents, for the taxpayers, uh, looking at the, the uh, extension, uh, seeing the extension of a minimum of, of uh, a one year to allow for a thorough RFP process. Uh, however, not necessarily limiting it to that. It seems like, again, as we look at Smart Santana, just overall uh, being having that be uh, an open-ended process so we can see, okay, what's the best deal so we can get this, uh, you know, provide the quality services to our community, uh, but ensure that we're being able to uh, implement as quickly as we can these uh, programs to be able to, uh, uh, again, benefit and, and address other uh, needs that our community has. Uh, so, given that, I, I would my, my thought is I would echo what, what uh, 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 Councilman mentioned with regard to you know, having an, an open-ended discussion uh, as part of this, nego this uh, extension negotiation that we'll be uh, potentially recommending here over the next 90 days. Okay, with that, uh, Councilor Villegas, please. Yeah, real quick comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, for bringing this up regarding this, because this has been an issue that's been, uh, we've been talking about for a while now, since uh, even since I was a candidate, I was receiving uh, information about this. And uh, I have no, no doubt that our staff will address the Prop 218 issue. And uh, I am supportive of 65B. And uh, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm sure we will correct this. Uh, well, I've only been here six months. This is something that's been going on for a very, very long time. And uh, but I'm sure we will correct that uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem again. Yeah, Mayor. I just want to get clarification because they're saying that item th um, number three, approve the proposed amendment and restated solid waste service agreement with uh, with waste management would put us in compliance with Prop 218. Can you help me understand how that is so, please? Actually, what, what, if, if you're quoting what we mentioned, what, what mm -hmm. I, I mentioned is that it would begin to address uh, be, be, that, that, you know, some uh, of the uh, questions uh, about, but there, it's a bigger so, issue. So we have yet to start, but we're in the process. Okay, well, okay, let me correct myself, because I think we have begun to address the 218 issue with uh, some of the other items. That, so it would continue to address okay. that it would, and, and, with and this I contract And I speak to this now, um, uh, Mr. M uh, about this issue, because I addressed the water issue for 10 years until last year. We finally chose not to transfer any money 
after two studies that I asked for. And so I'm going to be honest with you. I have no confidence in our staff, nor do I have no confidence on the city council, because as long as it took pertaining to our water issues and to this issue that I've been bringing up for the past five years. And so I am very concerned. I will continue and I will continue to address this until it is handled and it is expedited because this here is just starting a process. It doesn't mean we're going to finish. When we did the water study, it took not only one but twice so that you, so that city staff could get what they, what essentially what they wanted out of that report, but essentially had to put so much pressure, so much pressure. And now they're telling us that we have a structural deficit because we're no longer transferring water funds to our general fund when we shouldn't have done that in the first place. So let's, let's understand what we're doing here and what this city has done here for many years. It is time that we do right by our residents. I'm here for 18 more months and I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure we do what's right because I've had enough. I've been here for 11 years asking for these issues to be addressed and they are barely starting to get addressed because why I have come out publicly. I am now coming out publicly and if I have to go to the state and the attorney general because you all do not fix this issue, I will do it. Councilor Van Avides. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate uh, the, the uh, passion that sometimes is expressed uh, here, and I, I definitely agree with doing right by the community. Uh, I, I do uh, take issue with, with some of this the suggestion that there are illegalities taking place or that we cannot trust our staff. Uh, at different times, some of all of us on the council have uh, addressed and, and uh, our staff and have commended them for their hard work and at, throughout you know, the different departments and so I, I don't want to paint everyone and, and, uh, uh, with the same uh, brush or, or even in any way uh, you know, suggest that, that our staff are not uh, hardworking, trustworthy uh, folks. I think we're all trying, working hard to address uh, the issues in our community, provide quality services, manage their funds uh, uh, well, and, uh, and that's part of what we're looking at doing here tonight, is, is making sure that there is transparency using the uh, 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 terms of, of the city attorney. Is, are there still other things that we'll need to address and fix and, and modify? Uh, yes, and we, we will uh, continue uh, to do that. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, bring some, some clarity there. With regard to the item, what we're discussing here tonight, I'm ready to go ahead and, and, and make a motion. Uh, the only thing that I would, uh, on, on all the staff recommendations here on 65B, uh, the only thing I would like to uh, uh, modify slightly was with item one, the way it's termed, it's, it, it says uh, authorized st uh, staff to start negotiation of a one-year extension. And I would just say uh, uh, authorized staff to, to start negotiation of an extension. Uh, of the current agreement with USA uh, Waste of California. Within those 90 days, you can come back and see, uh, look at the one year, look at what, uh, uh, if there are any other options, uh, so that it isn't uh, uh, limited. And then from there, we can decide, you know, what, uh, what, what the best option is you know, for. Yeah, um, thank you, council members. We can, second that. We, can, we can do that, but if we open up this uh, negotiation into a longer term contract that will take way more than 90, 90 days for us to come back with, with alternatives. If it was the intention was to have a short term extension then we'll be able to deliver within 90, within 90 days okay. because the scope is limited. But if, if the council pre uh, prefers to have various options for extension then uh, I, would I think ask what I to hear. I think what that. I hear the council members saying is they just want to leave it to our discretion and come right. back in 90 and days and report. Back. Come back They're in 90 not, more right. time. They want to see what we can do, and I, I think that actually is a good suggestion because it doesn't pin us into any particular position. It leaves it open so we can come back. Yeah, that's, that's precisely uh, definitely the 90-day window because I know that you need to get some time, some type of direction, you know, from us, and and it it may likely be, you know, it's it's a 12 month, you know, and that and that would be fine. That's the best recommendation. If there if there's something else as you're going through this negotiation process that comes up that you think is is a uh, uh, a value to bring to council, we just didn't want to limit you. So Understood. that's so we'll go ahead and, and uh, that that's again 
that the motion. Your motion. There's a second. Comment on the motion, Council Sarmiento. Well, I'm, I'd like some clarity from the city attorney, and I appreciate the council members' comments. I think that they're well intended. Um, I think you want to have some flexibility and, and um, some ability for staff to negotiate. But that was my concern that I think you had just mentioned. If the direction is unclear on whether it's a, uh, you know, uh, an extension for a year or an, extent, an indefinite extension, that's a completely different premise, right? So I just want to make sure we're clear I, I think on we are very clear based on the policy conversation that's occurred, what you prefer in terms of moving forward. Because if you approve item number two, then we know it's not indefinite. Because if you, if you approve item number one, and you just don't tie our hands as to the negotiation, but you also approve number two, then we know it's not indefinite, because we know you want to go out with an RFP. Uh, but I do believe that there's some value in allowing staff to just have a negotiation, knowing that number two is staring us in the face and that this council is committed to doing an RFP as well. Right. So, so based upon that, and I think that two does limit it to um, some finality at, at some point or some definition of what the, what the extension is going to be, um, I'm willing to support it just to make sure that um, you know, the Mayor Pro Tem's comments are really important for us to, uh, you know, to consider because I know that not only are we grappling with this whole problem, but many agencies are, I mean, throughout the state, you know, with this whole 218. So um, we're very sensitive to that, which is one of the reasons why I think that, um, you know, we're trying to move this along so we can get into compliance, and I think that's what everybody wants to do. So um, I'm supportive of the uh, motion. All right, we've had some uh, discussion. I just wanted to ask the city attorney maybe to give us a little bit of guidance on, you know, that gray line between on Prop 218 as to whether we go this way or do something else and legality versus illegality and, uh, you know, just thoughts on that, please. You know, Proposition 218 was adopted by the voters in 1997, went into effect. Um, case law continues to come down on Proposition 218 to this very day. San Juan, City of San Juan Capistrano just last year um, dealt with a water rate issue that, you know, has gone all the way up to the California Supreme Court and whatnot. Um, the City of Santa Ana has some Prop 218 issues, and we are slowly but surely addressing each and every one of them. Um, it is my opinion that by going in this direction, we are making progress towards you know, fixing them. We're not going to be able to fix every single one of them overnight, but I'll let you know that from the city attorney's perspective, I'm absolutely committed to, committed to giving you recommendations to fix it. And this recommendation is taking a step in that direction. I also believe that at some point, if we um, go through this RFQ process with a new or the same or just selecting a new a, a hauler and under a new contract, that we may be able to address some of these issues. Because of all the new laws that have gone into place and all the new ways that we can collect different air, uh, revenue or recover actual costs of service and impacts on our streets, I think that we may be able to also solve this. I, I, I can't tell you that by doing this we're going to have solved it, but I can tell you that we are definitely making steps in that direction, I think, to Councilmember Benavides' um, comments. And so I can tell you that by doing this tonight, you are not taking an illegal action. Um, you are not completely solving all of your 218 issues, but you're taking a step in the, direct, in the right direction. Is that fair? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just, just yes, sorry, go ahead. Not, not to change the, to, to the motion, but just some additional insights and thoughts. Uh, I, too, support the SMART program, so that's another reason why we need to do this restatement of the agreement so we have a real maintenance plan for our streets. Uh, starting with, with right, that needs a, a lot of help. Uh, also, the RFP, let's get that going. Uh, in terms of the length of time, I mean, the reality, too, is staff's been working with the current hauler some time, and if they haven't had ideas for anything long-term, the idea is probably that we're looking at some shorter-term options, but I just don't want to tie the hands of the, of the staff. And then in terms of uh, revenue and, you know, helping residents getting the best deal for them and, and taxpayers, you know, we also want to think about the revenue base for the city so we can continue to provide the services that we are. And I know there's a lot of interest in continuing to do more for youth services and public safety services. So thinking about revenue for a city is important. And then finally, also with this uh, additional I idea of not tying your hands on what type of agreement you negotiate, if we can address additional Prop 218 issues through this negotiation process, I want that to be thought about as well so that in 90 days when this comes back, we have, you know, ideas there as well. And so I would 
you know, ask that uh, our, our city staff as well as uh, the, the trash hauler think about ways to address uh, that. And then finally, I know it got in, indirectly uh, brought up, but, you know, there is the sister waste contract that is the construction demolition contract that both uh, waste management, uh, wear disposal slash Madison materials are part of. Since we're considering these kinds of terms for this uh, hauler, we ought to consider sooner than later bringing back a similar staff item so we can give proper you know, direction so that that sister agreement have uh, the same considerations. Sure. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate, I believe, uh, was it uh, Councilor uh, Sarmiento that said that you want to make sure that the other companies would be included in this motion so that we're not just um, singling one, one company, but that all of them are included, correct? Okay, so with that, we've had plenty of discussion. I believe we have a motion and a second. Um, so with that, I will ask for the uh, vote. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And now um, we go on to item 75A and out of an abundance of caution and because some folks that worked on my campaign are uh, uh, now active in the medical marijuana uh, industry, I prefer to abstain. So I'm just going to turn matters over to Mayor Pro Tem Martinez and I will let you know that there are uh, three speakers on that item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have three speaker speakers, as he's indicated. So I'm going to start with the first one, who is uh, Jason Quinones, followed by Lilia Teflin, and then Robert Teflin. Hello, Council. Um, my name is Jason Quinones. I'm the president, of Santa Ana, or the president of Santa Ana Cannabis Association, SACA. We are an association of licensed, permitted uh, dispensaries in the city of Santa Ana. Um, our goal is to work with the police, the council, and the residents to ensure uh, best quality life of the residents while promoting the legal aspects of this industry. Um, just like the neighborhood association, we too want to make sure all the rogue uh, shops that litter the city especially the residents, or uh, especially in residential neighborhoods, parks, schools are no longer operating. <clears throat> I'd like to thank council members uh, for prioritizing the issues that affect our industry, and special thanks to the staff that work so hard, especially Robert Cortez, Alvaro Nunez, and their teams. We all know that Santa Ana is a pioneer uh, city of, or, sorry, pa pioneer city of cannabis, and we appreciate all the work. I just have a couple of suggestions uh, of the expansion of hours. We know that staff is recommending from 10 a.m. to midnight. Uh, we would like to suggest 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, that will help the patients that work night shift to be able to come to the permitted dispensaries and help operators with staffing employees so they, could, can, so they can hire full-time positions of eight-hour shifts. Extending hours will help our stores similar to CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, or any like other business that dispense medicine to our people. Hope you can consider my recommendation so legal dispensaries can combat rogue illegal dispensaries and uh, make more revenue for the city. Thank you for counsel and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. Lilia, followed by Robert Teflin. And sir, please make sure to speak on the topic on this item. Yes, I. Uh, good, e good evening, Mayor Pulido, and respectful uh, Santa Ana City Council members and public. My name is Ilya Ceglin. I am the voice of my son, Nate, and the people. I am talking about regarding public safety. And marijuana, medical marijuana, it's a part of it. When we talking about medical drugs, why not allow medical marijuana leave it alone with people and see what for the profit of public offices they put people on dangerous, harmful drugs, psychotropic, killing people. 
So why not allow the marijuana that can save people's life to be uh, acceptable for people? Only because medical marijuana will be for people, not for the government profit? If I am here, that only because the justice has failed. I do appreciate the respectful city council members to assist in saving innocent life. I supply all information on CD to city attorney for many months ago, ago. What they doing in the court? What is the injustice and lies and cover up by judges like Hubbard and public defender like Petrosina and Hill and Bianchi? All these lies, all this cover up on the CD. I want her to look and to share with you. Until now, I have no response from her. I, I sent her many messages, email, asking when it's happened. Why the police department Mr. cannot... Mr. you have to turn, please conclude your red. Okay. Thank you. I, I want to say Robert, just take, Robert. only why police department not on the side of justice. Thank you, sir. Robert. Hello, Honorable um, uh, Board, I mean, uh, Santa Ana City Council. Uh, this is Robert Seglin, Brother Nick Seglin. With regard to this uh, particular item, I'm trying to look through it. <clears throat> but uh, regarding uh, permits and marijuana permits and so forth, and just a comment I would make, try to make in connection with that, is that uh, I would be more um, supportive of not, not only generally less regulation of that, but I would be wondering why, um, as I might just make a small comment, maybe one minute comment, a brief difference or, or a, a dichotomy between where you have an individual, uh, where you have people who receive uh, medical marijuana and you have an individual who's receiving uh, Cyprexa and Depakote. And so I would say it would be <clears throat> quite um, reasonable to uh, provide people the right to uh, use drugs or not to use these uh, drugs like marijuana, which if you compare, you can uh, read the literature, compare marijuana and Zyprexa. <clears throat> Zyprexa can cause imminent death uh, through uh, uh, failure, of heart failure, uh, as, as can Depakote. I, I believe so. You can check this for yourself. Uh, whereas marijuana, in many cases, as you might know well, <coughs> can be used for other uh, terminal il illnesses and so forth. So I would like you to uh, definitely less regulation there. And uh, obviously it might seem that there would <coughs> be uh, the only reason why government would regulate that and not regulate the uh, psychotropic drugs is, as my father alludes to, there's a profit motive from the pharmaceutical companies and that's why we're coming to the board hopefully they'll intervene in this issue where a person is being poisoned to death my brother in particular in Santa Ana and that could be resolved and hopefully using your agencies and jurisdiction thank you thank you Robert so that is it for comment I'm going to bring it back to uh, to the item uh, which is uh, time for uh, to consider adopting the ordinance amendment regarding medical marijuana collective cooperatives and licenses. Uh, start with uh, Councilman Sarmiento and then Councilman Solorio. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. So um, I want to thank, start off by thanking our staff for uh, doing the work that we directed staff to do. This was an 85A that I had uh, put on the uh, on the agenda, I believe, with Council Member Benavides. And um, I also want to thank the operators who took the time to meet with staff and engage in discussions and uh, thank both of you, uh, both groups, for your patience. Um, uh, you know, this was a measure that was adopted a few years ago and approved by the voters through a Measure BB referendum. So this is something that was, um, that was pursuant to the will of the voters um, a few years ago. And there was a catch-all provision, from what I understand, Madam City Attorney, that we're using now to, to augment and to adjust. And I don't think this will be the only adjustment that we make to Measure BB as the industry continues to evolve and, and develop. So um, this is our first, I guess, a, adjustment to that measure. And I, again, I don't think it'll be the last. But I do think it's important that we revisit this issue periodically. And I don't think that... Um, um, these will be the only adjustments even in the near future. But these are adjustments that were recommended by 
the operators to staff and staff um, work together with the operators to deliberate what some of these adjustments were and I think somebody had mentioned the hours of operation which uh, which is included in the list of enumerated items that include signage adjustments um, the overnight cash limits delivery financial audits and um, delivery and other procedures that uh, uh, are, are available here so um, I think on the on the hours of operation, I think the recommendation or the suggested um, adjustment to 7 to 11 p.m. versus going to midnight is probably a, a good one. I think that all our residents are concerned about um, secondary impacts from being open late at night. And we know that the state could come down and opine on this and obviously um, uh, supersede whatever we uh, decide here. So if they decide 10 p.m. Is, the, is, is as late as we go or we can't open before 9 or you know, 10, then obviously we're subject to that, um, you know, to that direction. But given where we are, I would be willing to go ahead and, um, and entertain that adjustment to the hours from 7 in the morning to 11 p.m. because it does ratchet it up uh, an hour uh, and, and we don't stay open as late and we reduce the secondary impacts again. <laughs> Um, I know that one of the things, one of the issues that was removed when I had first included this was um, a research and development um, provision having to do with testing and so I want to thank staff for removing that because I, I was under the impression that that was an, an item that was discussed with the operators and it really wasn't as much and I think it needs a little bit more vetting and I think as we come back to items um, having to do with potentially developing the industry to include um, cultivation, manufacturing. I think that's a better arena and a better context to have the discussion of research and development and testing and you know the whole pharmaceutical side. Um, I think a lot of the a lot of what we're doing is trying to create opportunities and jobs in the city. I think you know when we first began this um, path, you know a couple of years ago, there was about 120 to 130. Uh, uh, dispensaries that were operating illegally and now from what I last heard I think at um, at a, a couple of meetings ago we're down to less than 20 that's obviously still not an acceptable number but we're on the right path so I just want to I just want to thank our code enforcement folks staff uh, uh, and the city attorney's office and our police department for doing a real robust effort we've got a ways to go but you guys are certainly have have, have certainly reduced the number of illegal operators and they were all over they weren't confined to our zones they were all over our neighborhoods and commercial areas so you've done an excellent job and I thank you all on behalf of our residents for that so um, you know as we continue to look at this I would just make a suggestion and it doesn't have to be part of the motion but I just want it to to be understood for staff and, and madam city manager you know as we continue this maybe we look at some of those other ancillary industries having to do with cultivation and manufacturing um, and testing just because what we have done on the retail side versus the supplier wholesale side really um, the the heavy lift was on the retail side because that's where most of the secondary impacts are right and our sensitive receptors you know parks schools residences those are the ones that are most impacted by these the other side the supply side or the wholesale side really doesn't have that um, uh, severe an impact on on our residents, so that's something for us to consider as they generate jobs, as they reven uh, generate revenue for the city as well. So I would say that this is uh, one in a series of adjustments that I think we should consider. But um, but given that, I will uh, uh, make a motion to adopt 75A with the adjustment on the hours from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. I'll second that. Go ahead, Councilman. Yes, uh, thank you. I really want to echo many of the council members' uh, uh, comments. Uh, you know, we're having really this conversation today because the voters some years ago approved Measure BB and created this regulated system so that we can have legal uh, medical marijuana dispensaries in our cities. Uh, you know, we had you know sometimes over a hundred illegal ones, and we try to shut them down, and then they would just pop up somewhere else, and it was like playing whack-a-mole. So we'd have to send out. PD and code enforcement to, to deal with illegal ones, and we'd even get to the point of 
uh, shutting down the, like, their electricity. They'd bring in generators. You know, we turn on their, turn off their water. They'd bring in their their own water, and it's really been a, a big complexity. But now, some some years later, we're under uh, ten illegal uh, marijuana facilities. There's still one on 17th Street. Uh, so the one on 17th Street, uh, they're in the Floral Park area, and perhaps two uh, have come up again. So please, if we can have uh, code enforcement and PD uh, go out and, and address that. Um, I think based off the conversation that we had on, on the council uh, some weeks ago, our public safety uh, committee that I chaired uh, went point by point on all these items and saw what, what were some easy but significant changes that we could make that would be good for operators and good for residents and consumers. And so what you have before you, uh, you know, is really a, a reflection of that. Um, and so since, since then, really the only new ideas that have come from uh, the regulated community, because you are a regulated community, uh, is reconsideration of the hours. Uh, we initially had thought that maybe there was interest in doing it up to midnight, uh, but they're now seeing more of a benefit in going earlier so that people before uh, going to work can can you know go purchase their medication uh, and then in later when there are you know less issues as well for the community and, and PD. You know these facilities are uh, in, in you know commercial industrial areas, so luckily they have limited residential impact, but still going earlier makes sense. And there is the opportunity of doing two full eight-hour shifts rather than uh, some some odd shifts. So I, I do support that. And then I believe too that the changes that we're making tonight, uh, not that it's you know the foremost priority, but it is going to increase uh, the revenue base to the city and create more jobs in the process. But just to give you a sense for this current fiscal year, the, the city had projected that um, about $1.5 million would be generated uh, from uh, the sale of medical marijuana. It's in fact now 2.5. Uh, so the stores are doing really well and they continue to grow and we want to support their, their growth and they, they are good jobs. Uh, and I predict that next year, now that there's more maturing, we're going to add you know, one, more, one or two more this next fiscal year. That amount of is going to grow, I think, to 3.5 to, to 5 million. So that's a very good thing for, for our community. Um, at our public safety committee, just because there are issues for not just the regulated community, but also residents and, and, and law enforcement at our public safety committee, we have this as a regular item on our agenda. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, uh, we're going to have a special session to talk about uh, future more complicated uh, improvements or changes to the ordinance, whether it be R&D, testing, manufacturing, cultivation, uh, and then we're open for other ideas also from, from the regulated community or residents in terms of how we could uh, improve that. So I do want to thank uh, uh, all my colleagues. I know uh, Councilmember Tina Harrow, who's not with us, he's also on our Public Safety Committee. I know he's been very supportive of this item and has been in a number of meetings. Uh, and uh, Councilmember Villegas, also on that committee, has done a lot of great work in this area. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to support this and uh, we'll continue to you know, do good by our residents and uh, also work closely with the regulated community. So thank you. Councilman Benavides, followed by Councilman Villegas. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I want to thank staff as well for preparing uh, this item, bringing it forward. As uh, Councilman Sarmiento mentioned, this is an item that we had, have actually been talking about and working on for, for well over a year. Uh, there's a white paper that was drafted by staff under at the, at the direction of, of council back uh, last year, uh, I believe in the fall. Uh, so there's been some research and preparation to be able to get here, a number of meetings that staff has had with the operators. Uh, you know, uh, the... the uh, uh, there's no secret that when Measure BB uh, was presented and considered by council, I, I was uh, uh, adamant, you know, adamantly opposed uh, at the time, uh, seeing that uh, there were a lot of, of these uh, unregulated and uh, rogue dispensaries peppered throughout the city. They were causing a lot of concerns, a lot of issues, a lot of negative impacts to our residents, to our neighborhoods. And I had a serious concern that by uh, legitimizing some that it would actually perpetuate the problem even more. Uh, I, I'm, I'll own the fact now, you know, in retrospect, you know, go, going back, they say hind hindsight is, is 20, 20 and, and now looking back, uh, my colleagues were, were correct in that part of what they were proposing is they said this would be an opportunity and a way for us to be able to regulate more clearly. Uh, there were quite a few uh, stipulations, very thorough on hours of operation, on security, on a number of different things. Uh, and now, again, looking back, 
Uh, we have significantly cleaned up that problem. It's still, there are still some of those that are out there that that's, are still fighting to stay uh, uh, open, even though they're, they're illegal. Uh, uh, however, those that are, are regulated, they are uh, very uh, much in compliance. I've, I've actually been impressed by driving by a few where I see that there's clearly been some improvements to a commercial building and uh, curious as to what the, the, the type of... Uh, 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 business that came into town and doing a little bit of research, I find out that it's actually one of these dispensaries that is actually providing some uh, kind of uh, cleaning up the, the area in the neighborhood and, and uh, that, that commercial area. So I'm glad to be able to see that. Also, the, the revenue generation that has been brought forward uh, is as a, also a positive thing. A couple of things that uh, have happened uh, in the last few months, particularly back in November, we had Proposition 64. Regardless of where, what your position uh, was on that, the voters, again, as, as with Measure BB, voters decided and they voted and they, they gave clear direction to, uh, sta to, to the city. Prop 64 residents, uh, voters from throughout California voted and uh, voted to uh, legalize uh, uh, cannabis throughout uh, uh, the state. And, uh, and to lift the restriction, the medicinal restriction, essentially making it available to all adults uh, coming January of 2018. Uh, so one of the things that I would urge us, my colleagues and, and uh, staff, to do is for us to be prepared uh, for that, that, that uh, uh, implementation that's going to be coming at, uh, come January. The last thing we want to do is, is uh, be kind of be unprepared, be behind the eight ball, uh, and then have, you know, potentially not having a system, a, a, a process by which uh, we, were, we will regulate or permit uh, uh, operators, and then we end up in a similar situation as we were before without, you know, the systems to be able to regulate. So I would just urge us to look at, you know, within uh, the, the not-too-distant future, ideally by, by fall, um, have something that we can consider with regard to how we're going to uh, potentially uh, allow for 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 uh, permits for a process uh, for again just general uh, sale. Also, some of these other uh, items that have been addressed by by uh, members of the council and that have been addressed by some of the research that staff, that staff has done with regard to cultivation, manufacturing, uh, jobs. As was mentioned, is is one of the, the key pieces there and something that I would uh, mention both to the uh, new association that has been established and to staff as we look at re uh, at uh, our processes and, and ordinances and updates going forward, there have been a number of operators that have chosen to uh, adopt uh, uh, essentially a labor uh, process and, and, and for union-based uh, 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 employee employment and benefits and, and, and really making it something where, where it's a, uh, a respectable way to be able to allow you know, for job creation and and, and support, uh, allow people to be able to support families and, and, and receive some of the benefits. So I would urge, you know, the President of the Association and, and again, staff, as we look forward uh, to make some of these other modifications that we would consider, uh, I believe it's uh, the UFCW that, that is working with uh, workers throughout the state as they organize, and I think that would be a best practice. I know we have at least one, if not a couple of them, here in, in the city. It would be great to be able to expand that, again, for uh, good jobs uh, to be created uh, within our city. So those are some of my comments, and I hope that I'll thank be supporting you, the Thank you, Councilman Benavides. Councilman Villegas. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, thank you. Just a quick comment. I am not a, uh, for the record, I'm not a fan of the marijuana industry. But as a member of this council and as a professional, we need to be fair to all the legal establishments. And uh, I support the, uh, the council member's uh, suggestion uh, or the motion for the uh, 7 11 hours, 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I also want to thank Code Enforcement and the PD for all the good work that they do and the hard work that they do in uh, dealing with the uh, non legal vendors of this uh, industry. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, say Councilman that. Thank Beer. you very much. Thank you very much. I had some. Uh couple questions as it pertains, and I'm supportive of the hour extension, uh, but one of the questions I would have as it pertains to cost recovery uh, in regards to our staff, um, and I'm not sure where we're at with that. I know we have city attorney expenses, we have code enforcement expenses, we have planning, and the amount of revenues that we've generated, and Councilman Solorio mentioned that we were anticipating 1.5, we're now over 2.1 million. Um, I would just ask uh, what have been the costs 
as it pertains to our staff and have we been able to recover it? And then my second question would be, um, as we move forward, definitely there is going to be more of, of a workload as we look at other, um, you know, whether it's cultivation, whether it's manufacturing, distribution, and as we look at our budget and wanting to tighten, you know, we're having to tighten the belt with the various departments, well, are the current staff that we have now, will they be able to handle that workload? So the, 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 the question I would ask is, do we want to extend, um, you know, because um, uh, I guess each store makes about, should be making about $11,000 a month. I don't know what, if they're in that range or not. Um, and if they are, if we were to uh, add an additional two to four stores, that would generate more revenue. And uh, um, my concern is, uh, you know, continuing to extend hours and doing these other things, but not generating enough revenue to recover costs for a lot of the issues that we're having to deal with, whether it's public safety, whether it's city attorney, code enforcement, planning. I just want to make sure that we are able to recover the costs and are we providing the appropriate tools and resources to our staff so they can get the job done. I'd like to just maybe answer that, Mayor Pro Tem, from the city attorney's perspective. Um, the original proposal was to fund two city attorney positions, um, full-time positions, to work on the enforcement issues. We did get one full-time position, um, and then some, a little bit of contract money was provided. Um, I would have to disclose to the council that some of the litigation expenses that we've incurred because of um, direct challenges to Measure B, we're not even talking about enforcement, we're just talking about protecting the measure that the voters approved, um, were significantly more than we anticipated. So um, I would have to defer to finance in terms of what the exact dollars were, but I do expect some of those litigation expenses to go away as we resolve those cases. Um, in terms of resources, um, we still have 20, 10 to 20 illegal dispensaries. Certainly if we had that one more full-time person, we could probably make significant progress in, the, in that area, and I know that that was an issue that the Public Safety Committee discussed. Um, and so I, 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 that, that would be the input from, this, from the legal side. So based on that, um, Madam um, City Manager, uh, what would be the additional revenue coming in uh, based on the extended hours that we are recommending here today? We estimated in the budget it would be an additional million dollars. One we million. believe that's incredibly, that is very conservative. Okay. Uh, so it may be higher than that. We do still have, we just recently got an application for one more legal dispensary, and uh, we believe we may see some more. As to the cost recovery, I'd have to ask planning if they could uh, talk to, uh, specifically about their cost recovery. Uh, but I will say that this is something that will be looked at in the, co the, the new fee study. Uh, we have a better idea now of what costs are, uh, what is the potential for the revenue by the number of establishments and, and under the rules the council has so carefully crafted. And in that study, which is due back to you in January, we will definitely look at whether or not the, the cost is being recovered for enforcement uh, with both the attorney's office and police as well as the processing of applications. Great. If I can get planning to... I'll respond to it in the same way. We were anticipating to have a better knowledge of it once the, the user study. fee study was completed. Um, so what I would like, and I'm supportive of this, and I know um, Councilman Sarmiento wants to come back with some additional um, items as it pertains to distribution, manufacturing, on and so forth, that we also um, bring back, you know, what are we going, what is it going to take to recover those costs from our planning staff, from our city attorneys, from our code enforcement. Again, I wanting to make sure that not only that these dispensaries succeed and, 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 and making things much easier for them, but at the same time, it's important for us to make sure that our staff is able to recover, you know, the cost of doing business in, in, in this particular area. Um, as, as we continue to, to face structural deficits, we're saying we're going to continue to receive money but it would that money be enough to, to to sustain the city efforts and making sure that we don't have these illegal dispensaries con continuing to pop up so we need a comprehensive approach not only moving um, you know these the this this industry in the right direction and providing more flexibility to them but at the same time making sure that we have the staff to, to accommodate you know what what we're trying to do um, so with that, yes, Councilman Solorio. Yeah, just, just to add a little bit more, I, I know in uh, some of our committee meetings we talked about these historical costs and, 
you know, when we were first just trying to get rid of all the legal ones, there was a lot of court enforcement time, police department time, planning time, city attorney time. We think in these future years there won't be, uh, you know, as, as much a requirement for those things, but there still will be some. I know our committee did uh, suggest that either in this next fiscal year's budget or through a mid-year budget that we look to see if we could to afford to actually fill uh, a second uh, you know, position in the city attorney's office. And uh, I know I had asked this some time ago, but I don't, I don't remember whether we were able to put it in this year's uh, budget or, or, or whether we're going to have to do it through a mid-year budget consideration. I don't know if our city attorney or, or uh, acting city manager or uh, deputy city manager Cortez, I know he's been... Uh, tracking this day-to-day -day for us as well. Let me look at what the, the difference is between the one position and the contract services money and see. It sounds like it would be a pretty minimal additional uh, amount of dollars to the attorney's office to fill that and see if we can't build that into uh, the, the budget, whether it, if you do first reading tonight, and we'll do it into second reading. If you don't, we'll do it into the first reading. Yeah, let's consider that because, again, things are getting better. But as Councilmember Benavides mentioned, you know, we do have a Prop 64 that's going to allow, uh, you know, legal recreational uh, f facilities. And so there, there will be some, you know, additional planning, you know, PD, code enforcement, other costs, uh, city attorney costs associated with that. So we do want to not lose track of the fact that even though we're in a good place right now, there are going to be additional issues down the road. Thank you. Great. Call for uh, uh, the question. I think there's a, I think yeah, I moved in. There's a, a second. second. There's a motion. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Fantastic. Mayor Polito, you can please join us now. So as he's coming is 75B, which we're continuing a hearing to adopt the ordinance to regulate mobile food vending vehicles. I just wanted to just state for the record, we can't um, talk about this issue because uh, our clerk has indicated, um, you knew we were going to continue this item, so people that wanted to speak left, but um, I'm just disappointed because I, we've continued this item and continue this item. We definitely need to uh, either move with the recommendation or just table it. You know, I, I, I think it's come to that, you know, continue it four, five, six times is just, you know, we're not conducting our business here and we, we need to do that because I'm, I'm tired of seeing it on the agenda. No, I, I agree. I think a lot of good work's been done. If staff does need to update its recommendation, please do. Uh, but we owe it to the public and the, 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 the food truck vendor community to act on this. Thank you. It is ready. It will not change. We moved it only because of capacity of thinking that it probably wasn't going to be able to be heard tonight at a reasonable hour. So I commit to you, you will have it on your agenda for Ju July 5th. So at this point, I believe the recommendations continue, so I'll go ahead and move the continuance to July 5th. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. Thank you. Those opposed, motion carries. Now we're on item 75C. This is uh, basically the city budget for fiscal year 2017-18. And we have some speakers. Kim McPeck, followed by Mike Lopez. And after that, uh, Victor Madrigal. And after that, uh, Tony Car Carrillo. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, City Manager, City Attorney. Thanks for allowing us this time to speak to you. I'd like to take you back on a little journey, back to 2009-2010 fiscal year where it was all gloom and doom. And the management come to our union and the other unions and said, we either got pink slips for your employees or we got cutbacks for your employees. Take your pick. We knew that our services had been cut to the bone. It takes so long to hire somebody that retires or gets promoted that our services were at a very low level. So we took the cutbacks. And we saved the jobs of a lot of our newer employees. Even though we did that, we were furloughed for 60 days, 60 working days, 480 hours times 400 employees. My family took home about $20,000 less 
because of that hit. And it hurt. But you know what? We provided service to the city of Santa Ana the best we could. And we're damn proud of it. Along about that time, they come in with another idea. We're really hurting. We're going to go bankrupt. Pay some money towards your retirement. They asked all the unions. Only one union stood up. The SEIU. That cost my family another... That cost my family another $4,500. And I could not stand here today and say, hey, council, why don't you look into giving us our money from our furloughs? Because we didn't come to work. My wife and children's got to enjoy me being at home for 60 extra days. 480 hours harping on them about not being able to go to work and serve the public. But boy, I tell you what, when you guys had that audit up on that board last meeting, and I'm looking at 2012, 2013, 2014, and millions of dollars being put in the bank, mainly because of attrition, and positions not being filled, and knowing our job is a lot more demanding because those people aren't there. And I'm going, wow! I lost about $4,500 that I gave up for retirement. At the same time, the city's stuffing money in the bank. And I can only say, Mr. Miles Leach used to stand right here. And what did he say, Mr. Mayor? Figures don't lie, but liars, they can figure. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Mike Lopez. I'm with Santa Ana Chapter 721, SEIU 721. I'm here, and it's my privilege, on behalf of my professional colleagues who are in the audience this evening, to deliver a statement to the City Council, and that is, no budget without equity. We're asking you... We stood before you the last three uh, council meetings and we supported staff's recommendation for the fiscal and budget policy. That made good sense and so we supported it. But as we go, as we come to you this evening with regards to this budget, we can't support this. In fact, you have a moral decision before you this evening as to whether or not you're going to vote yes or no for this. We're just asking you to vote no. And let me remind you very quickly, Kim uh, mentioned that the auditor supported the, uh, or told you the information with regards to the last five years. Those last five years, the city has projected budget deficits. In fact, one year, $17 million in deficits. But yet, the facts reveal that they not only balance those budgets every year, but they also had money to move forward. So unless things are different, we can expect the same thing moving forward. They're projecting a $12.5 million uh, deficit, don't believe it. We know that you've got 77 millions in revenue, and we're confident that the city is going to continue to make the revenues and balance forward. Now, Mayor Pro Tem, it's very timely that you recognize one of the community leaders this, uh, this evening with regards to the housing and the living wage in the, the uh, county of Orange. And we just want to leave you with a few uh, facts with regards to that fact. Of the seven largest uh, cities in Orange County, uh, the biggest uh, city with the number of residents per employee is Garden Grove. They have 211 residents per one employee. Guess who's next? Santa Ana. 201. And then it's Fullerton, 153. And the state average, 103. So what does that tell you? That 50% of employees that we lost during the Great Recession has been busting their tails for you and we're still providing the service for you. Now, who has the number one salaries in Orange County of those seven largest cities? Garden Grove, 76,299. Where's Santa Ana? 59,676. So even though we're just a few residents away from being at the same work uh, uh, efforts that we match up against Garden Grove, we're still down on the on them. Okay. Now the living wage for uh, Orange County is 63,668. Now what that means is that 33% of our workforce 
is below the living wage. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about equity and you talk about fairness, I want you to remember that. In closing, I implore you to do the right thing on behalf of the loyal, conscientious, and hardworking service providers, and that is no budget without equity. Victor. Victor followed by Tony. Victor followed by Tony. Victor followed by Tony, followed by Mark uh, Kiss. Good evening, council members. I think you all know me. I'm a 30 year, 30 years with the city. And this is the first time that it hurts me to hear that you guys in the budget have nothing for us. And you have to remember, everything's about the money. I stayed for 30 years and I gave you the best years, the best service, and now you come up with that. I, I think it's very unfair that you have money for other departments and other people. I said, hire managers, and let's see if the managers go out there and do the work that we do, the worker bees out there. So please, look at the budget and see where the money is so you can give us what is deserved to us. Jim talked about the years that we gave you money up. I was giving up $1,000 a month. The city was happy. Hey, listen, Victor is giving us $1,000 a month. Let's see if we can work it out that, that way. Victor, run over there. Victor, run over here. Go do this. Go do that. Nobody said anything. There was no money. Then the money came in, and the city put it away. And now I hear that there's no money for us. I think it's very unfair that you guys are looking at the budget and not putting that money for us aside. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. My name is Tony Carrillo. I'm also an employee here for the City of Santa Ana. I just want to bring up a couple of things for you. Uh, as my colleagues have mentioned earlier, we've gone from a thousand, over a thousand employees or members serving this community day in, day out. A lot of our members have been here for many, many years and continue to want to be here for many, many years. But we have gone from... Speak into the mic, please. I'm sorry. We have gone from over 1,100, or excuse me, over 1,000 members to just a little bit over 400 members. The work hasn't gone away. The load hasn't gone away. We're doing more because we're trying to do what's best for the community. So what I'm here to tell you is that the community out there has full-time needs. They're not part-time needs. We have gone from 1,100 employees to 400, and meanwhile, our, our part-time employees have risen to over 400. There are actually a lot more of them in our union than we are full-time members. So they're uh, the biggest bulk of them. Now, I understand during the cutbacks, the departments had to do what they needed to do. They were either faced with taking a part-time position or no help at all. Now it's not the time to continue that trend. So I ask you to direct your management, direct the city to reverse that course and start filling up those full-time positions. We need a full-time service. This community deserves a full-time service. And with that, I'll just close with saying this. All we're here to do is ask one thing. You want to be treated with respect? We want to be treated with respect. The budget, the way it sits now, there's no respect there for us at all. As a matter of fact, it's very insulting. So please, uh, guide your people, tell them what they need to do, and let's get some respect on the table for our members. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, followed by Monica Suter. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and the council members. Uh, I'm Mark Kiss. I'm a 30-year plus uh, 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 employee of the uh, police department, and I'm also one of the police department representatives to the Santa Ana chapter SEIU Local 721 board. Um, obviously, I know that for all of you, it's a very difficult decision whenever you have to deal with a budget, and in particular this year, with recent events from the past year and some upcoming events in the future years, uh, make it especially challenging for the long-term economic stability of the city and also its ab ability to provide the resources that I and my fellow uh, members of SEIU provide every day to the residents of this community. Um, 
I know when you look at the budget and you look at any municipal budget, personnel uh, salaries is always the biggest component. And some people tend to look at that as, as a burden. But I actually look at that as a resource because hidden in those line items and those numbers in the budget are the men and women who work every day to keep the parks open and clean, who provide, um, receive the payments in the uh, utility offices, who provide the help and assistance for the people who want to open businesses and build in our community. So they're the people who actually make this community work for the residents and the business owners and the visitors who come here to our city. Um, when you look at that uh, line item two and its percentage of the city budget, I think one thing is very obvious that when you invest in that item, when you invest in the city employees, you're also investing in the community because you're enabling them to continue to provide that level of service that I know all of you wish to provide for the residents of our community. So it's a wise investment because it makes the city better. And also, a lot of, there's a lot of collegiality between the different departments and agencies in the city. You know, we're almost like, like a family. And uh, like every family, we have our ups, we have our downs, um, we share in the good times. Sometimes we have to give up and we have to sacrifice in the bad times. And, uh, you know, maybe mom and dad might have their favorites. But when you sit down at the table, when you come together, everybody gets served, everybody gets a plate. Everybody shares. So in conclusion, I'd like to just... Uh, suggest to you that as you grapple with your ultimate decision about the city budget, that you make the best decision for the residents and the business owners of our community, but you also make a decision that recognizes the efforts and the contributions of the men and women who work every day to keep that community great for those people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Monica Suter. Monica Suter, followed by Jonathan Hernandez. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Monica Suter, and I'm also speaking on behalf of SEIU 721 Santa Ana chapter tonight. Budgets reflect values. And Unfortunately, we cannot support approval of a budget tonight that doesn't represent equity and the stated values that we are hearing from the community and, and this council. So to have a values but uh, balanced budget, there must be equity because safety and community and meeting the needs of that, that is, as I mentioned before, a team effort. Not only the upfront investment in prevention, but the ongoing maintenance of intersections, sidewalks, streets, code enforcement, violations, parks, all these things, investing in our youth, and also being there when there's a crash or if there's a fatality or if there's an emergency or a water line break, uh, any kind of issue out there in the community. So we're seeing that this budget doesn't re re reflect that equity or show value that we value all of our employees. And so we, we talked tonight about those sacrifices that have been made by our families to support the city's stated fiscal situation. And those annual surpluses have now actually continued for six years where there's an anticipated deficit and then it turns out there's a surplus, a revenue surplus. So unfortunately, we understand there's some long-term issues and all that, but there's got to be equity. There has got to be equity. And at a minimum equity. And when our employees were taking furloughs to the tune of 24%, there was a budget surplus of $15 million that year. That's pretty hard for our employees to hear. Because they stood up. We stood up. And we, we thought everybody was going to hold hands and do that because we were there. You all know. You, many of you were there. And um, so we did that. And so now... Since we were there when you needed us, we're basically asking that you be there to make sure that there's equity at least and that we are remembered for what we've contributed to this city because we care and we want to continue to serve. But we need help. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Jonathan Hernandez. Jonathan Hernandez. 
followed by Albert Castillo. Yeah, John, maybe Jonathan Hernandez. Followed by Albert Castillo. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Polito and, and City Council members for being here today. Um, I wanted to talk about um, 75C, uh, the fiscal year for 2017-2018. Uh, you guys see me here a lot. Um, for some of you guys that don't know, my name is Jonathan Hernandez. I'm a San Ana resident from Artesia Pilar. I'm also the founder and executive director of Santa Ana Unidos, an intervention and prevention program that this year will provide an in-kind donation of services of over $1.1 million to Santa Ana families. Um, in addition to that, I'm here today to demand that you guys invest more in our youth during the fiscal 2017 and 2018 year and reject any attempts to provide an increase um, to repay any political debt that you may owe to the Santa Ana Police Department and the Santa Ana Police Officers Association as well. I, I ask myself, we are the youngest city in Orange County. Why are our elected officials failing to invest in our young people when we know the fact that our kids, our young people are dying in the street? As elected officials, we carry that blood on our hands. When we fail to invest, we are putting our kids second. We are giving them the most readily accessible option, and that's to quit. We are telling our youth to quit. The time is now that we invest in youth programs. If we look at this and we prioritize our funding for programs that address trauma and abuse, support youth development and mental health, we can redirect these, these funds to community-based programs we will see an increase in our graduation rates. We will see healthy, safer communities, um, and I believe it's something that will affect all of us positively. Um, so the time to, is now to redistribute our resources evenly and, um, and really put our, our youth first as the youngest city. Thank you. Thank you. Albert. Followed by uh, Moises Velasquez. Uh, speaking on blood in our hands, the uh, new city or acting city attorney just appointed David Valentin as our acting chief. Without asking our residents or, or our city council who should they, uh, or she should appoint, he came into our city not knowing our city, not knowing our community, and appoint somebody like that as our chief. That's a big mistake. Second, I'm right now asking for an independent audit of our city. It seems our city's not doing very well, and Michelle's right. This is what's needed for many years, and I, I support that, and a lot of community members also support that. And third, in 2016, out of 270 employees with a total compens compensation of $200,000 or more, 226 are police. That's a lot of money. It's not going to SEIU. It's going to 270, 226 employees. Imagine that, $200,000. We're making a big mistake here, and we need to correct this. Thank you. Thank you. Moises. Moises followed by Claudia Perez. Good evening. My name is Moises Vasquez. I'm a resident of Santa Ana and also work with youth at Latino Health Access. Um, in a city with very little open space, we ask that as you discuss the city budget for 2018, that you make our youth a priority and invest in our youth. We ask that you designate funding to work with the school district and establish a joint use agreement to open school grounds in neighborhoods where there are no parks for youth and families to be active and play. I grew up in the city. Um, I grew up playing in, in streets, playing in, in parking lots. Um, the closest park to my neighborhood was French Park, which is probably smaller than this room. Um, today, as we speak, today there are youth still playing in parking lots, playing in the streets, trespassing school grounds to find a safe place where they can play. It's, it's, that's not acceptable. We need, often I've seen police officers coming and kicking them out because they are trespassing. 
and that does not do any good for the dynamic between our youth and the police officers. So th we ask that you take in consideration and make our youth a priority as you discuss the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Followed by uh, Sergio Barragan. Hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Perez. I'm a resident here in Santana. I'm here to demand that you all invest money on a young folks, right? We owe it to the young folks um, to have green spaces, to have affordable housing, to have a place where they can just go and have counseling aside from schools, right? Um, so I'm demanding that you all allocate those funds for young folks. Um, it's not time to, again, uh, start creating a uh, like a system of like, oh, you're at fault, you're at fault, the parents are at fault, no, the youth are at fault, oh, the city council, right? We're here to work together and we need to make that happen. We need to start allocating those funds um, and start looking for the future of the young folks because I am the mentor at Resilience Orange County for these young folks and when I look at them, I want them to be in the position that all of you are in. So thank you. Thank you. Sergio, followed by David Celedon. Hello, everyone. My name is Sergio Varagan. Um, I'm here to propose an idea for a youth department. Not only just for one department, just dedicated to youth, mainly everything dedicated to youth. Mental health, athletics, anything that youth will need. Um, Basically, I just want you guys to invest more in youth, not more in police. We need more things youth-oriented than just police officers. Do you, really, do you guys really want to see your future mainly in jails now? David Celedon, followed by Ignacio Bies Jr. Hello, y'all. Um, I'm David Celedon. I'm a Redis. Well, I'm born and raised here in Santa Ana. I'm here to ask you guys to, you know what? I'm here to demand for you guys to invest money in us, youth, because what I just learned, like a couple of weeks ago, was that you guys spend more money on the police officers. 50%, 53% to be exact, goes to police officers instead of youth. And you guys waste $12,232 per youth arrest and only $119 per youth investment. So saying that me, if I get arrested, I'm, you guys are going to make money off me. And when I get out of jail, if I go to jail, you guys are only going to give me $119 to help me out. And that's what we don't want. Because with those $119, we cannot do nothing for the youth. So I'm here to say, don't give money to the police no more. Give that money to us, to us youth, because we're the future of this city, and we might be the one city next and up there. Thank you. Ignacio followed by Perla Dionisio. Buenas tardes, good evening. Um, as previously mentioned, um, we're demanding that, that within your, your fiscal, fiscal year allocations, we invest more in our youth. Um, creating more opportunities for our youth to thrive. Giving our youth tools so they can create. Um, job opportunities, internship opportunities, uh, extracurricular activities, all important. But in addition to these opportunities and these tools, we need to support our youth emotionally. Um, we need to supplement their social emotional health. And we have to look at it, uh, youth, youth support and youth health holistically. Um, and to be able to do so, we need to have our own youth department. A youth department dedicated to this. Um, dedicated to, dedicated to their holistic health. Um, and one, I know for a fact that within, um, Within active transportation, within public works, there was money allocated for, a public trans for an active transportation coordinator. And with that coordinator, what resulted out of that, out of that was 
more bike pedestrian plans. Um, it resulted in and more policies and more programs. And that's exactly what we need. That's what we can start off with. A coordinator, a youth coordinator to start, um, start allocating resources, start looking at how can we strategize to prioritize our youth? How can we start creating programs? How can we start connecting all the community programs that are available and, and plug in our youth to these programs? Um, as we look at the city budget, you all have to understand that your decisions are an interconnected web of cause and effect. Um, whatever decisions you make will directly affect our youth, and not just with youth programs. Know that with 32% with of our families here in Santa Ana um, being low income or very low income category, know that by providing affordable housing to our families, you are being preventative. You are preventing a youth from having to work a job to support their family. You are preventing a youth from having to cope with these um, stresses from not being able to pay rent. Um, so let's prioritize our youth in every single way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Perla. Okay, buenas noches. Uh, my name is Perla Dionisio and I am here again. Um, something tragic happened a block away from where I live and work. A father stabbed himself to death in front of his children and his family. How are you as a city going to provide services, mental health services, not just for today or tomorrow, but for this child's rest of his life? So I'm going to leave you with that question. And again, we do not need ice on our streets. You guys keep bringing it up at every council meeting. We do not need that. We need to heal. We need to bring healing circles to our youth. We need to fund our youth programs. We need to make sure that our youth are not worried about paying the rent. We need to make them focus on university. SAUSC, which I am so proud to work for, has been working on getting our youth interested in attending university. And a lot of, us, a lot of our kids do. Today at my school, at the fifth grade promotion, we had four girls. They're all going to amazing schools, and they're all doing great things. But they came back, they graduated last night. So, I want to make sure that more of my students get to that level, that more of my students are not worried about helping their parents work rent or pay, work to pay their rent, or like me, having to cut grass on the weekends and on every vacation that I had during high school. I need to make sure that the youth of right now don't go and don't struggle the way I did when I was their age. And sitting in a seat that does not belong to you, Jose Solorio, does nothing for my community. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to bring it um, back to the City Council for discussion and consideration. Any thoughts, uh, Councilor Benavides, please? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I have a number of different, uh, uh, a number of thoughts. One of the, uh, so there's three recommendations here that, that we have uh, tonight. The first one is to authorize uh, use of fund balance from the general fund uh, in the amount of $9.3 million in order for us to balance next year's budget. Uh, that's, a, that's a significant uh, amount of, of funds that we are essentially taking. There's been mention from uh, members of the community and speakers that uh, over the last couple of years we were able to uh, create uh, a fund or funds we have we've have had uh, funds that have either been surplus or, or, or number whatever term we want to refer to it essentially funds that have not been allocated in order for us to be able to provide improvement quality of life uh, benefits to the residents we've made a number of different promises or, or at least uh, prioritize uh, uh, efforts projects whether it be uh, parks or whether it be general plan amend uh, 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 Updates, a number of different things that would ultimately benefit our community. Um, and tonight, essentially, what we're considering is having that all, all of that go away in order to be able to balance. Uh, 
I, I did hear a number of, of reasonable requests and, and, and uh, from members of, our, of, of the public. Uh, ultimately, I think one of the things that came to mind, uh, a statement that came to mind as one of the speakers was, was talking about, is the fact that we reap what we sow. Uh, we're, we're a very young city, youngest city in the nation, second densest city in the state of California. The way I see it is, is we're a city of promise. When you think of all the young people, the potential, the gifts, the talent that our young people have, um, and at the same time, we have uh, a lot of challenge and we're losing, a, we continue to lose a lot of our young people. Um, so the question I think for us is, is what are we going to do? What are we doing or what can we do? Can we think outside the box and think about what we might be able to do in the next fiscal year's budget uh, so that maybe we're not just sending all that $9.3 million and not, not having something that we can point to to say uh, that we're doing something a bit differently. There's, there was mention of this youth department, which is an interesting idea. Uh, to, again, prioritize our young people. Say, hey, they, our, our youth are important. We're going to invest in them. We're going to look at how we can help them succeed over years. I mentioned before, uh, doing a little bit more research uh, over the last couple of weeks in a uh, city of, of uh, a number of different cities within the, the, within the, uh, the, the, the country, particularly the city of Denver, looked at. They have a whole department under actually the, the mayor's office, much larger city, but they have a, a whole team of people that are looking at ensuring that their youth uh, succeed in that city. Uh, I would hope that we would be able to consider doing something uh, similar. Uh, perhaps at this point we may not be ready to, to do something uh, to that degree, but perhaps we can at least allocate one uh, uh, person, one uh, position that would be able to, again, say we're, we're committed to prioritizing our young people and help us move towards that. So, so the question is would I, would I want to uh, uh, would I want to amend the budget to include that? Yes, ultimately I would. Uh, I would so that, that Madam would be. City Manager, did you um, understand what he was talking about from a monetary standpoint? Included. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, what the council member is speaking to is uh, the gentleman that talked about a youth coordinator. So it would be adding a position. Um, and I couldn't say sitting here tonight what level of position that would be, but adding a position to our budget is not an unsurmountable. Um, uh, requests from the council most certainly what I would do first it goes back and look at vacant positions that we have and see if we might bring forward one of those vacancies and say this sounds more important than something else that we haven't filled um, and uh, see if, if we could find then a place whether that would be in the city manager's office or in parks and rec since they run most of our youth programs we could discuss that at a different time all right, well, look, why don't we hold that as a motion that we'll make, and when we make the motion, we'll, we'll add that um, mm -hmm. to what's proposed. But let me hear more input from other folks. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jose Soloni and Michelle, who wants to go first? I haven't raised my hand yet, Mr. Mayor. He didn't All right, go that. ahead. Mayor well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to read something. You know, this was a couple months ago, and it was an article, and in, in, in particular, it, it was uh, referencing Richmond, which I try to compare. When we benchmark and we look at its cities, Richmond is a very similar city to Santa Ana and what it's experiencing. So I just wanted to read something. I also know the mayor, Mayor Butt, Tom Butts, was a good friend of mine. He's the mayor over there in Richmond. And we tend to, 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 to talk when we see each other. We sit on the local government commission together. So we're always trying to see how we can help each other. But it said this a couple months ago. Last month, the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, the state pension fund, lowered its projected rate of return on investment from 7.5 to 7% per year. That means that a city like Richmond, Santa Ana, and other communities will have to pay more each year to fund future pension benefits. The change is expected to increase local government pay pension payments by at least 20 percent starting in 2018, according to CalPERS spokeswoman Amy Morgan. According to CalPERS, there were two active workers for every retiree in its system in 2001. Today, there is 1.3 workers for every retiree. In the next 10 or 20 years, there will be as few as 0.6 workers for each retiree collecting a pension. Because benefits have already been promised to today's workers and retirees, cuts in pension benefits for new employees do little to ease the immediate burden 
It means decades before the full burden of this will be completely dealt with, said Phil Batchelor, former Contra Costa County Administrator and former interim city manager of Richmond. Today, Richmond taxpayers are spending more to make up for their underperforming pension investments. CalPERS projects that the city payments for unfunded pension liabilities will more than double in their next five years from 11.2 to $26.8 million. That's Richmond. Santa Ana is not too far from that, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm not going to go more into detail. We need to realize that we're not in a sustainable course right now. We have a choice to make. Either Santa Ana is going to become a different city because services are going to decline dramatically, or we have to figure out how to, uh, how to pay the cost that we're going to be giving. The city faces a structural deficit and has faced a structural deficit as long as I've been on this city council since 2006. And when I speak of a structural deficit, what I mean is that we have more expenses than we have revenues coming in. And when we try to benchmark and compare ourselves to other cities, the reality is this, the amount of revenue that's being generated into the city of Santa Ana is less than cities comparable of our size. That is a fact. Knowing that we know that, should we continue to give further increases in salaries? And not like I don't want to, because in 2015 and 2016, the city, uh, the city actually gave 2.5 across the board to all our employees. We gave that. Because we knew back in, back in the day, and I want to thank SEIU, they gave the most. They sacrificed the most out of everyone. And you know what? In many respects, as I look back, it was wrong of us because we cut them to the bone. We made them do furloughs. And moving forward, for whatever reason, we kept saying we had deficits, but we kept misprojecting. And then... Three years ago, we get somebody to come in to manage our city, and he starts to say that we have these major surpluses. That is a slap in the face to all our city employees, to the community, after we told them time and time again that we had problems. Yes, we were once upon a time in the brink of bankruptcy. We had to make some tough choices. But the reality is, this city hasn't modernized all its city services. We haven't generated any additional revenue to help offset our expenses. We've continued to give increases. We continue to do more programs, promising that we have not been able to generate that additional revenue. And number three, ladies and gentlemen, because of the surpluses that we supposedly had and the attrition savings and not being able to fill those positions, we created this perception that we would be able to provide the programs from our strategic plan, these other programs of the 11.5 million that we made promises. And today we're here saying that we have a choice. We either are going to move forward with that or we're going to use those monies to balance our budget. These are all one-time funds. A lot of people are confused out there when the auditor said we have about $77 million of one-time funds. The reality is that that is the uncertainty fund um, and also the reserves. That's the majority. There's about 27 million of those funds that were attrition, sa attrition savings or salary savings, whatever we want to call them, plus the projects that uh, we said we were going to do that in many respects we are here today telling you that we possibly may not because we have to use those one-time funds. I asked, I put together, and my, our city manager uh, and her staff were able to, to provide, I, I put together 30 questions, and she sent it to the city council. I've also, also asked uh, my clerk to put this 
for, for the public and I'm not going to go all into it because I received it around 415 and haven't been able to review everything to go into major detail but one of the things that I do want to make very clear is that in this year's general fund budget yes SEIU you are very right that there are no labor negotiated increases in this budget if this city council is going to want to give any increases to all the bargaining unit who are up and who are we are negotiating, they are going to have to come back before this city council to approve that, to reallocate the funds because of, as of right now, there is, in this budget, there is no money for increases. And so we need to understand that and know that. And the other issue that is on the budget, and I will conclude, is to direct the staff to transition from a type two jail facility to a holding facility during the fiscal year 2017, 2018. That is on the table as well. If we choose not to do that here today, that's an additional $3.7 million deficit it to um, to our budget so yes this mayor and council has a big decision to make this is not on the staff here today or our interim city manager this is a policy decision if we want to move forward with these recommendations and I would just conclude with this our values matter and when we talk about young people, and we talk about wanting to provide programs to our community, whether it's through code enforcement, so that we could have beautification of our neighborhoods, talked about trees today with Mr. Benninger and saying, we probably can't continue to afford that with the amount of revenue that we have. You know, our staff is, is to the bone, and, and yes, can we go out there and possibly get some grant funding, but by the time that comes, that's 18, 24 months from now, our trees are dying. Our staff is embarrassed out there. We have tough choices to make, but we have to tell our truth. And our truth is that we're not in a position to give any increases. I just told you about our purse system. That is the big tsunami for local government. You know, for me, it seems like deja vu because in 2008 and 2009, I actually was in tears telling my colleagues not to give increases because we were in, in a financial dire situation. Our staff was stressed out. We still did. We still made changes. And guess what? And you heard it from SEIU. We had to do all those things. We had to outsource our fire department. We're back here again. And even in a worse situation because I'm hearing that the adjustments of CalPERS there's rumor out there. They could go even lower than 7%. They're talking 6%. I was just at the California League of Cities Latino Caucus retreat, and, and we were having that pension discussion that there are conversations of that possibly happening. If that happens, this is not just detrimental for the city of Santa Ana. This is going to hurt communities across California. And so... What our preferred future looks like is dependent on the policies and direction we set on this dais. And so I would just urge my colleagues to understand the context that we're dealing with today. Let's not just think micro, we have to think macro. And yes, I may not be here 18 months from now, but I've never led in policy about how this is going to benefit me tomorrow. I've always been long term and wanting to leave something behind better than I found it. And we all should strive to do that on, the, on behalf of the residents and the, and the employees of this community. I was on a water tour with our water uh, staff, manage, you know, staff, um, and let me tell you, we have some of the most amazing folks working in this community that many of them live here they care but i can see and i can sense it here with these employees here 
that they know that we have a problem. These folks are on the ground every single day. They can't do their job. So the decision we have here today, we're either going to approve or not approve one-time funds. And if that is the case, not to move in that direction, guess what? We can't make any more cuts. We're going to be eliminating programs. That's essentially where we're going. And if not, we continue to be uh, thinking that we could afford what we're currently uh, doing, I do believe that we can think about going into bankruptcy again. And that's not something that we should be doing because we have the opportunity right now to make the tough decisions to help our staff figure this out. But we have to, be we have to constrain ourselves and know where we're going. And I just hope that my colleagues will be able to make the right decisions here tonight. Thank you. More comments? Councilmember Benavides, I think, already spoke. Uh, Councilmember Villegas. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, so what are you uh, proposing then? I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, you know, for a conversation. For conversation? Yeah. You're asking me, or yeah. it was, it's your position? Well, you've I'm been here, here to I'm debate said, up here with you. Know, you. Well, I'm saying that this is what's on the table right now. Right, <laughs> right. And you said you want us to rethink this, so what is the other option? What, how do we fix this? Obviously, I stated my position. I'm not going to tell you how I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to All vote right, on these you. items, but I, I think I stated what I what I what uh, I believe. Yes. Okay. Understood. No more. No further comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, Councilmember Ben Sarmiento, Jose Solorio. No. Are we ready for a motion then? I'd entertain a motion. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, since everybody wants to speak at a turn, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I am, um, you know, I uh, want to thank everybody who came up here and spoke, and I, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage. I was out of um, not only town, but out of the country for the past couple of weeks, so I haven't had a chance to really delve into some of the um, specifics on this. I do have some reservations about um, you know the perusal of the of the budget as proposed uh, on this, I do see some um, concerns that uh, Mayor Pro Tem mentioned about the three point seven million ongoing if we don't consider uh, item two of this um, recommended action on the transition from the type two facility that we have to a holding facility i don 't think that consumes the entire jail. I think it only consumes two of the four floors, if I'm not mistaken. And I know that we've had some discussions in the past about a jail reuse study that I think is still pending. So that may give us some options on what we can do with the other half of the um, facility. And uh, we hopefully that'll be another, uh, maybe not revenue generating source, but a source of funds that will help reduce the, the deficit that we're carrying for the facility. So um, that's something that I'm willing to consider. Um, in addition to item number one, which is the use of the one-time funds. And so um, I, do, I would like to um, consider putting the approval of the budget over until July 5th and um, revisiting it then. Uh, again, you know, I'd like to sit down with staff and you know, consider some of the comments that were made tonight by the public from my colleagues. I know that they're, you know, they've got some interest in some issues that are important. I think um, I'm just not prepared at this time. And my question to the to Madam City Attorney, if we do that and if we consider this and adopt a first reading on July 5th, we would need a resolution to continue it uh, beyond the deadline. Is that correct? Well, the charter requires you to adopt your budget um, by the in, before the end of the fiscal year. So I would have to kind of you know challenge you that, that that's your timeline and mandated by the charter. Uh, we have provided some some advice on this issue and would suggest that you at least adopt a resolution that would carry over your existing budget into the new year into the new fiscal year um, as a as a you know interim measure. Um, but of course, the preferred route would be that you comply with the charter and adopt the budget. Right. So that, that carryover, it would still allow for us to honor existing contracts, continue to pay our employees, 
And um, it's probably not very different than what Congress does with its continuing resolution, correct? Correct. It's very similar to that, in fact, yes. And we're probably looking at going out two weeks beyond what our deadline would be. Yes. And that would be a recommendation if that you're not prepared to adopt the, the budget, that you at least adopt that reso so that you can continue making payments and carrying on the business of the city while you contemplate another budget. Okay. That's just something I'd like you know the rest of the council to consider in the event that we can't come to some um, conclusion. All right. Um, look, uh, I know that earlier we had a suggestion by Councillor Benavides. Maybe let's restate uh, your suggestion in a form of a motion, I would suggest. And uh, we get a second, and then we can have a discussion on the motion. I, I, I still would, one is I would have, like to get a little bit more clarity from the city attorney on the, uh, the question that Councilman Sarmiento posed. Uh, and uh, and I, did, I still also have additional questions. Uh, so, Go ahead. Uh, well, one, of the, one is in the area of economic development. I've had little, some, some conversation with the uh, uh, city manager around this. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, the key things that's important as we look at uh, budget shortfalls is at the end of the day, our, our revenue comes in from predominantly uh, business community, right, sales and, and such out in the, uh, throughout the city. Uh, when we look at uh, areas of opportunity, if you will, or, or areas that we're, that we're struggling, that we're not necessarily at the place we need to be, uh, in addition to comment uh, that some of the public made earlier and, and some of my comments uh, earlier with regard to support, uh, supporting our young people and investing in our young people, uh, business attraction, business ret retention. Again, when we have uh, one person trying to address the needs uh, of the economic development in our city, we're, we're, we're grossly uh, understaffed. And as we look at these projections of shortfalls, again, the question I think if we're looking at, you know, with foresight, what are we going to do in this next year? Uh, not just to cut, but what are we going to do to intentionally and be, uh, be proactive about uh, attracting business, about supporting business that's, that's here, about helping our businesses thrive so that that revenue can increase, so that we can uh, uh, gradually get out of the hole that we're in and, and be able to provide the quality services that our public needs and deserves. Uh, so uh, one of the other, again, holes that I see there that I, that I, I don't see reflected is uh, augmenting the economic development uh, staff and, and uh, having at least an additional person to be able to help uh, get us uh, heading in the direction that we need to head in with regard again to economic development. Is there, have we added any, any, any position uh, to economic development in this next the proposed budget? Well, we have not added any positions. I might call the council's attention to inside your booklet you have the presentation. We do have a list of revenue ideas that were captured from the discussion at the council's last meeting, plus some that the staff has added. We've asked each department to also meet with staff uh, and to bring revenue ideas forward. So this list would expand, and I assure you everything on it would be looked at. We also have a list of and it was done quickly, so I would not suggest that it's 100% accurate. It may be low, but a list of all the dollars in the budget, both the capital you've already adopted and the operating budget, that we spend on economic development, on youth and family, and on homelessness. So you can see what's currently in the budget. I do agree, though, Councilman, that, that the need to have additional staff in economic development and one of the things that I would like to do um, is look at the Community Development Agency and the Planning Department jointly and see if there are some efficiencies that we might have in those departments that would allow us to supplement. I believe they need to be supplemented in the area of economic development. I believe we need more inspectors because uh, we're hurting business by them waiting two weeks for an inspection, uh, and I believe that we need more code enforcement. Uh, for some of the reasons that you've talked about before, and one of the sources of that may be uh, some of the new regulations and dollars that would come with the, the cannabis rules that uh, the council is looking at. So uh, I would expect that as soon as the first quarter, we would be back before the council with recommendations 
uh, for staffing in those three areas. They're going to need to come from existing appropriations uh, or uh, new fees that we see are possible because business uh, has improved. So, so thank you for that, that the background and the information the, and the uh, packet as well and, and uh, presentation. Uh, I, I do think that as we look forward, again, taking if, if we are going to consider next fiscal year and uh, setting some priorities, I think it, it would definitely make sense for us to be able to, to demonstrate that by uh, designating these at least two uh, roles and positions and then ultimately going out and figuring out, you know, as you mentioned, there are some mechanisms, some ideas that you have already in mind, but I think uh, uh, stating those and bringing those in uh, now uh, would, would make sense or at the time of budget adoption. Uh, so, so those are some of my comments, but I, I would like to go back and, and understand uh, if we were not to approve uh, budget tonight, if we're roll over, what, what would we need to, what would need to take place tonight in order for that to, take, to, to, for that to happen? And secondly, what would be the implications, if any, uh, of not having the budget approved by July 1, but rather potentially applying it, uh, adopting it July 5th, which is when our next meeting is? So you have two things happening simultaneously. Your charter actually permits you to go up through um, the end of July to consider the final mm -hmm. adoption. Yeah. But because your charter also requires you to adopt this by ordinance, having the first and second reading, um, you have all these competing things that are happening. I think I believe that's why the charter says you haven't until July because if you had the first reading at this last meeting in June, you had a second reading in July, uh, it gets you to that date. So. If you cannot adopt your final budget before the end of July or have that second reading before the end of July, my recommendation would be that at some point in the future, if we realize that that's not going to take effect, that your new budget will not take effect before the end of July, we would propose a resolution that would allow you to continue to spend, pay your employees, pay your bills in accordance with the previous budget. It's kind of like a continuing resolution. You're just continuing the status quo. Because um, your budget, your budget, you won't have a budget, and so that would be our recommendation. If I may, Council Member, may there's some things that we ought to consider based on all the input and testimony that we had today, and if we can do it that way, it'll be coming back on the fifth of July. So I would request that maybe Council Member Sarmiento make a motion to that effect. Let's make sure it's the correct motion so that it does what we want it to do and uh, see if there's a second and then we'll uh you know we'll be back at it on the fifth please council member well i think you just made my motion mr mayor so that's uh, your yeah. motion so that would be to direct staff to prepare a resolution to carry this over um and direct our staff to continue with its existing obligations both to our employees and our uh existing contracts as well is there a second I'll second that motion. Okay. Is the motion clear? I think it is. It is the staff. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it is. I mean, we're the budget is close. I mean, we don't have much latitude, and I think to Mayor Pro Tem's point, it's very it's tight. Very tight. So I think there's just some minor adjustments. I think that would need to be considered. Um, and again, we don't have all seven members here i haven't been here for a couple of weeks so it um it does make it um you know uh, the responsible thing i think to do would be just to revisit it one you know, one more time and again the reason why we're not making our deadline if i'm not mistaken is that if we would have if we were to revisit this on july 5th conceivably two weeks after that we would have had a meeting but we decided to go dark our second meeting in july which is why this is this problem is being caused had we kept that date which would be a second meeting in July we would have been fine so um, but it was a previous schedule all right problem. so that is a motion there's a second comment councilor Solodio uh, yes a couple of things first I know this was about the time that council member Tina Harrow uh, wanted I think right as soon as we're done with this and... he's ready to call he's ready to come online okay because he may be helpful in this budget discussion as, as, as well I believe uh, I don't, I'm not going to support this motion. I think it's really bad form to go down a practice of not approving budgets on time. 
I know some suggestions were made. Uh, we, we could speak to those as well as even post the budget. There's other actions that we could take to address any new issues that, that, that aren't in the budget. Uh, you know, I am ready to s support the staff's proposal really with the, the tweak also of uh, continue to explore other additional uses per the jail reuse study or, or otherwise. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the idea of, you know, just blowing through, uh, you know, a, a deadline that we typically meet, I don't think uh, uh, is, 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 is good form. Uh, and maybe we ought to at least uh, consider, uh, you know, passing, you know, a budget on time. And uh, maybe we need to take a break to have uh, Council Member Tina Harrow uh, also join in. But uh, I'm, I'm not supportive of not making an effort to pass a budget on time. We've had now new, this is our fourth or fifth discussion uh, on the budget, so it's not like if we haven't had time to uh, c consider this. And uh, I know uh, Council Member uh, Sarmiento, he's just trying to be you know, reflective in it and just got back and he, he's uh, interested in maybe considering more time. But given that we don't have another regularly scheduled meeting, uh, I'm thinking we at least ought to try to do something uh, uh, tonight. And again, we could consider other proposals uh, in the future. Nothing stops us from, you know, uh, reconsidering the budget or adding other considerations um, after May, may I first. suggest this? I was trying to get us moving forward, but let me suspend this discussion for a moment because we have Councilor Tina Hedda who's calling in. He's back east. If you can think it's late here, it's much later where he is, and we're going to lose him. I know he specifically wanted to vote on, I believe, is item 88. So if I may, let's just suspend that discussion for a moment. Um, I want to redirect our attention to ADA for a minute. It's the uh, housing and uh, affordability development projects. Let's take that on. And then we'll let him go to sleep and we'll continue with our discussion. Is that okay? All right. So let me, um, let me read the fact that... Um, so, I know. Um, uh, Council Member uh, Tinajero is uh, on the line. Uh, Sal, are you there? Can you say hello? Hello? All right. You're speaking to us from up above. Um, okay. And so prior to any roll call, just to confirm that it's Sal, uh, do folks believe that it is Sal's voice that is speaking to us? Sal, say something else. It has to be Sal's voice because it's incredibly sexy. <laughs> That's Sal. <laughs> Sounds like All right. I'm they kidding. think it's Sal. <laughs> they think it's Sal. Now, uh, Madam Clerk, I believe you have to call the roll in order to be able to include them in. When the vote is taken, it does have to be by roll call. All right. So let's go on to item 80A. I would entertain a motion. So Here moved. we have on 80A, we have some speakers. Oh. We have, oh, I thought we already had taken speakers last time. Go ahead. Jay Torres, followed by Larry Haynes, followed by Ruben Barreto, and Mario Turner. Mario Turner is uh, representing MCAL and he's available for questions. Please go ahead. Hi. Good evening. It's been a long one. Um, I have some really big issues with housing because we have so many homeless and we have a lot of our youth and our children living in our riverbeds. It's dangerous. It's unacceptable, and it's causing more harm than good. Plus, we have one of the highest rates of sexual predators that are running loose all over Santa Ana and may possibly be in our riverbeds as well due to the fact that when you look at their little red dot, it's like right there by the riverbed, these children are not getting schooled. Their families are using drugs and, and delicating. And so our police officers and our, and our workers have no help in getting the very little pay that they do get because a tent is now considered a dwelling with no address. 
So they can't get a court order to even get these children out. So my suggestion is to take some of that housing budget and actually enforce the law. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Larry Haynes. And Madam Clerk, can you do the lights, please? Go ahead, Larry. Keep it short. And sure. I will be very brief. Just Thank two, you. Just a couple of very quick points. Um, number one, in regards to what was just said, I just want to bring to your attention that some of the housing projects before you tonight do, in fact, address uh, housing for those that are homeless, both families and individuals. In particular, the Aqua Project, I just want to point out, especially in light of the budgetary conversation, that is not requesting any additional funds. That is simply a transfer of vouchers that are, co that are coming from HUD. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ruben Bar Barreto. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Ruben Barreto. I am part of Santana Building Healthy Communities. Um, and I'm here on behalf of uh, various orgs, and I passed out a letter. We have a letter of support that we, I, I shared with, with city staff so that you could all take a look at it, too. Um, and we're in support of ADA, uh, specifically in support for a policy and criteria for the allocation of affordable housing funds. And within that uh, letter, um, I also included some uh, numbers. So basically breaking down what all the numbers are for the projects that are being talked about for, um, for this agenda item. Um, the main ones, obviously, are uh, for the first street, um, and I just, before I go there, I wanted to break it down um, what affordable housing really means to, right? Um, in, our, uh, in our city, in our county, if you make $70,000, you're considered low income. So how does, that, how does that connect to really what affordable housing is for those residents who live in the community who are making $20,000, $30,000, right? Uh, so taking that into account, these projects, they are obviously uh, some, something that's needed in the city, and we, we are encouraged to see that there is this work on affordable housing. And then just uh, the fact that, for example, First Street Apartments has 34 units that really um, are for the lowest income uh, residents uh, out of the 69. Uh, for the Arts Collective, it has 20 units that are of the most uh, affordable for the community here. And for the Tiny Tim Plaza, there's five units that it has for those that are really uh, in need of affordable housing. So that document, I shared it. Um, I hope you can take a look at it. It'll give you a better perspective of it. And we hope that you move forward with uh, this project and those that come in the future as well, that they make sure and address the need for the lowest and low income um, residents here in the city of Santana. Thank you. Thank you. And pl prior to the vote, I just want to read another portion of the teleconferencing script. Uh, I would like to make it clear for the record that this meeting, as it should be reflected in the minutes, that at least a portion of the city council meeting is conducted pursuant to California Government Code Section 54953, and that council member Dina Hedo will be participating in the city council meeting by speaker phone. In accordance to the Brown Act, each teleconference location has been identified and noticed uh, with uh, an agenda for this meeting. Um, and Sal, as, uh, as, as far as you are concerned, that is the case at the location where you are, correct? There is a posted that is, agenda? That is, that is correct, Mr. Mayor. Got it. Is anybody present there with you in the middle of the night back east? The only person that's present with me right now is Got it. No more details, Sal. Um, so with that, um, uh, I thank you, Sal, for getting up and participating here. I'd now go back to Councilmember um, uh, earlier, Sarmiento, and uh, entertain a motion. Yeah, I simply wanted to thank staff and thank um, Sal for staying up with us as late as, as late as it is. I'm sure he had a full day debating with his um, students and he's leading a team out there in Alabama so good luck to you Sal um, one of the things I think that um, I know staff wanted some direction on is moving forward and I want to thank the ad hoc for their time that they've taken to go through um, work with um, with staff work with um, some of the uh, affordable housing developers and market rate developers you know I think moving forward what we're what we realize is we do have a crisis, a housing crisis, whether it's affecting folks um, 
being homeless, becoming homeless, or being on the on the precipice of being of being homeless. So our AMI is very low here in the city relative to the rest of the county. So to the extent that we look at policies and developments that promote um, units for extremely low income versus just low income, because I think there was um, there was a comment made earlier that families that are generating about seventy thousand, eighty thousand are are considered low income and and in eligible for affordable housing you know that uh, most of our families in, is an extremely high income level and so we have families with multiple children um, single parents that are having a very very difficult time and are being priced out and again and we're pushing them out into um, you know doubling and tripling up in a unit living in their vehicles um, uh, you know, forcing them and pricing them out of town. So I think this effort to try to create more additional housing, more affordable housing, is a commendable one. And I know we've, you know, this council has been a leader on that. So I want to thank my colleagues for um, having done this for a number of years. And so the other element I think that would be important for staff to consider as projects come forward is that those units should be on site as well. I know that we have the opt-out in lieu opportunity for developers to pay a fee and to um, you know bundle those fees for uh, other developments. I think there are plenty of studies that show that those affordable units that are right up against market rate units really help create an environment where people can thrive and improve their condition. So that would be something that um, uh, you know we should look upon favorably. And finally, I think developments that have multiple units. So I see that there are some developments that have single unit um, affordable um, uh, housing units. I think those units that have three and four bedroom, which are rare, um, are more, I guess, um, uh, valuable to some of our families because we have so many families with multiple children. So you know, putting a family in a single bedroom um, is probably not a real good healthy condition to, 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 to have, but if there are developments that have two and three bedrooms, those are um, those do create more opportunities for our working families that have difficulty with um, housing you know housing their uh, their uh, children so I um, you know again, I want to thank staff I want to thank um, the committee and, and and the public and the uh, development community for working with all of us and um, Support of the motion. Thank you. Um, and Sal, go ahead. I'd like to second the comment, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Go ahead and comment. Thank you very much. I just, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for allowing me to come on at this time of night. Um, but uh, it's been a long, eventful day out here uh, with a, a lot of our Santa Ana students. This is the first time I've been out at a national tournament with students from my own city. So I'm extremely proud of these students. And uh, I shared with them today that uh, we would be talking about this particular item. So uh, affordable housing is something that is in great need in our community. Um, it is the first step in breaking uh, individuals out of the cycle of poverty. It allows for our students to have a place to study. Um, in a dignified uh, living space. So uh, I'm going to be seconding this item, and I want to thank staff and everyone else involved for uh, their hard work in putting this forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jose Solario, and then uh, David Benavides. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as as you, you all know, I, I just uh, came to this issue this year, and I know from uh, the public and from the dais there are questions about you know, did one of these projects in particular receive some type of, you know, special process? Was the subsidy amount too high? And uh, my suggestion was, and we did go through a process of having an ad hoc committee, having a new uh, consultant look at not just one proposal, but all the proposals that were in the queue, because I do believe the resources are there for affordable housing and the need is now for affordable housing. So I thought that there was there was merit to a process where we could consider uh, several projects at once. Uh, I do think that the, the consultant uh, that staff hired did a good uh, job uh, analyzing, making new recommendations. Uh, I know then through our ad hoc committee and staff, they then uh, 
turned those uh, reports into the recommendations before us. Uh, I do support them. Uh, I also want to remind folks that uh, even in terms of the, um, these amounts, even though we've made mention of the word subsidy, they're really loans, so they're all going to be paid back and again towards, I think, a very worthwhile uh, cause uh, in, in our city. Um, having said that, I, I know that separate from um, supporting these, these core projects, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez made a very good point to that. Moving forward, we really ought to follow an RFP process, have a lot of time publicizing what the opportunities are, letting more folks know about the opportunities, but uh, we have a need now. We had some very quality projects uh, in the queue. I think we heard from um, folks in the audience about that today, so uh, I am in support of all the staff recommendations. I don't know if we really have a formal motion or not yet, but... Uh, I, I think we do have a formal motion, and it's basically the staff recommendation. Okay. Fair enough. So I, I support uh, the, the, the motion and um, uh, look forward to this housing being uh, built soon. Uh, the, the ad hoc committee continues. There's another uh, large project or two that wants to build uh, a sizable number of, of affordable uh, housing uh, units in town and with those projects and these projects again I'm really proud that we're gonna have really over about a two-year cycle about 1500 units of affordable housing units in Santa Ana and that's pretty cool you know we really have never done that you know very few if any communities have done something on that scale uh, and we shunned affordable housing for many years but the time is now the resources are there I know when I was first on the City Council we had a good amount of uh, uh, dollars for this we didn't spend them and you know what happened the state took them and so the need is now the, the resources are here let's let's move these projects forward and I'm proud to support these projects thank you were you uh, on the other side yes, when was. it happened yes he was what do you mean I was when on the other side money. when you took our money <laughs> everybody might recall that the city sued the state and the courts said sure, okay. watch what you wish for sure. all right thank you uh, Council Member Benavides. Thank you, Mayor. Good, good interesting point. <laughs> you forgot uh, you took her Made there with regard to who, where the money went. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I requested to speak mainly to, to clarify which, what the, the, the motion that it was staff recommendation that has been clarified. Uh, so I'm, I'm in agreement. Quality projects here, housing is needed. Appreciate members of the public that have that have addressed this. And as we go forward, you know, some one of the questions with regard to policy or future direction. I think having a, a competitive process by which uh, uh, different uh, entities uh, can provide uh, you know, ideas and, and projects uh, that uh, we can uh, can stand on their merits and, and that can can uh, compete for uh, future funds. I think makes sense. Looking at to some of the points, uh, looking at. Uh, family housing and, and city center where basically what where there is a need uh, you know there definitely is a need for for that those multi uh, uh, bedroom uh, units uh, we, we do have a lot of families in our city that's where the greatest need is and also looking at uh, you know within city center uh, I think uh, is also just where they're, where they're located as well uh, is, is important something to be factored and consider that I will be supportive of the motion as well thank you um, so with that, uh, what I'm going to uh, do is uh, call on Mayor Pro Tem. Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, I probably will be the only no vote. And it's not just that I'm not a, a, a for affordable housing. Again, I said it from day one of the process. I sat on this ad hoc, and still I asked staff to present me with the matrix. That was never pre provided to us. I also said to put it in this report. And, 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 and it wasn't presented. And so I, I had a list of questions, you know, for example, which projects were subject to RFP? It's, you know, the second was, what was the application pro, uh, process for each of the projects? How did staff evaluate each project? What criteria was used? How many outside dollars are being leveraged with city money for each project? What, what was it? Oh yeah, they could start answering. Madam City Manager, maybe staff can start answering because she's got a lot of questions. So, yeah, let me ask staff to come up. I do apologize. I know we did create a matrix. I, I apologize. I, I sort of had forgotten about it, but after the ad hoc meeting, I know we saw one. But I think that the staff here can, can answer the questions for you. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, mm -hmm. Members of the Council. Um, uh, Mayor Pertem, if you could repeat the first question. Yeah, which projects were subject to RFP? Okay, the uh, Santa Ana Arts Collective, 
<coughs> applied to the city for financial assistance through an RFP process on August 21st, 2015. Uh, Aqua Housing, uh, the Aqua Housing Project applied to the city for financial assistance through an RFP process on January 31st, 2017. Uh, the um, I'm sorry. Uh, First Street Apartments uh, applied to the city uh, through an RFP process for project-based vouchers in uh, uh, the winter of 2015, uh, and um, yeah, and those uh, and the, that is all. Yeah. So the others were not so tiny plaza but didn't go through an RFP process. Uh, that, that is correct. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, oh, the second question, what was the application process for each project? Uh, the application process? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, starting with the uh, Santa Ana Arts Collective, again, as I, as I stated, the, uh, uh, the project, the city I issued an RFP uh, in the summer of 2015, mm -hmm. and uh, that RFP was for... Uh, roughly $4.6 million in affordable housing funds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Santa Ana Arts Collective applied to that RFP and competed against uh, 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 three, other, uh, three other projects. Uh, on November 3rd, uh, 2015, the City Council uh, approved an award for, for $4.6 million for their project. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, the second project, Aqua Housing, uh, the city issued an RFP in uh, December 2016 uh, for perma uh, 100 units of permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. uh, Aqua Housing uh, submitted a proposal for that, uh, for that RFP and uh, uh, competed uh, with uh, the Santa Ana Veterans Village project uh, for those 100 project-based mm -hmm. vouchers. Uh, and on April 4th, uh, 2017, uh, City Council approved uh, an award for their project of 25 project-based vouchers. Um, for uh, the uh, First Street Apartments, uh, the uh, uh, First Street Apartments applied for uh, through an RFP process uh, in uh, the winter of 2015, uh, and I believe it was in May 2015 uh, that the City Council uh, approved an award of eight project-based vouchers for their project as well as eight project-based vouchers for uh, Andalusia at 815 North Harbor. Uh, Tiny Tim Plaza, uh, uh, again, uh, did, not, uh, did not apply through an RFP process or an application process. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and, and I'm not going to go into all my questions, but, you know, Council Minister Lawyer talked about this. These were in the queue, right? So we have a lot of inconsistencies about people that went through an RFP, supposedly people in the queue. And, again, I don't dispute that we don't need affordable housing. What I dispute is the process and being transparent uh, 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 about it. And, and, and I don't believe that we're there. The, the other questions, Judson, if you could just c come up, because this is really uh, where, where I have a lot of pro uh, problems moving forward, because we only have so much money, right? We have the, ho and, I, I, and I'm in agreement, if we can spend our housing dollars and our federal dollars and get them out as fast as we possibly can with the process, let's do it. Right. But when we have, you know, um, you know, the the other funds that the city can actually, you know, leverage um, a, a, as much as it possibly can to to provide, you know, the affordable housing that, that that we can provide. You know, I would ask how many outside dollars are being leveraged with city money for each of these projects. OK, for the um, Santa Ana Arts Collective mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, developer here, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, uh, if you could come on up. Uh, uh, so for the Santa Ana Arts Collective, uh, the project applied for 9% low-income housing tax credits and were awarded those tax credits in November 2016. Uh, the project also applied as a joint applicant with the City of Santa Ana for affordable housing and sustainable communities grant funds, mm -hmm. which are cap and trade funds. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mafferts, how much was, was that awarded fund? Yes, yeah, so we've. Uh, good evening, council members. I'm Chris Mafferts with Meta Housing. Um, we have secured uh, 18 million in, mm -hmm. in uh, tax credit, 9% tax credit mm -hmm. equity dollars, uh, 4.94 million in uh, AHSC affordable housing and mm -hmm. sustainable community funds. 
Um, we've also secured a $1.28 million uh, uh, infrastructure grant for a, a bike lane. So it's, it's actually separate mm -hmm. from the project. Um, and we're leveraging uh, $3.1 million in permanent financing that's, that's mm -hmm. um, from Bank of America or the CCRC. Or and so. how much private dollars are you as a developer dedicating to this project beyond the state grants and city uh, funds? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've agreed with Judson to put uh, 600 grand of our developer fee into the project. So, so and, and I don't raise that to, 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 to speak and say, you know, hey, what you're not doing is, 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 is not a cool project. But again, the ratio of public investment to private investment. And what the public is giving more than private. And essentially, you know, when I look at your, pro uh, I look at your project, the total cost per project is probably going to cost you five hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars per unit. Yeah. There's that's the estimate, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but the other the other part that I, I think is that you're also going to make money on this deal. Is is that a true statement or not? That is a true statement. It is yes. a true statement. Well, we have right, yeah. and so it's not about the public good. It's about you know the city is 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 giving funds in return. To, to, to provide true affordable housing, right? And you're getting all these other tax credits and cap and trade grants. And when I look at the public-private ratio, you know, it should either be equal, but it shouldn't be so heavy uh, on the public subsidy versus the private subsidy when you're going to make money on the project, right? So what is the benefit to the city? And so that's the question I ask. And when we look at the fundamental question about policy and about affordable housing, what does that mean for the city of Santa Ana? Not what it, what it means, AMI, to the federal, um, or, or what the state says, but what does this mean for the city of Santa Ana? And who are we trying to serve and help? That, that, that's the question that I ask my colleagues when we're going to distribute this kind of money out into our community. And so that's why I have a lot of difficulty of being able to support this because a lot of the money that is being requested, and look, I get the vouchers, support that, in particular Jamboree, Aqua, which they're, they're, they're trying to do to help the homeless population. But when a developer is making money and receiving tax credits, we have these properties going from commercial to residential and possibly will be, be removed off our tax rolls, right, because of the covenants of, of, of affordable, of, 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 these, of these funds. Kind of the city, in many respects, is not really winning. It's, we're, we're losing, right? So I just asked that question to us. And so as we move forward, and look, I understand, you know, the, the, the support may be here, but these are questions that we should be asking. And as we move forward and we look at policy, I just encourage my colleagues, because I'm not here trying to be the mean person that I'm against affordable housing or not, but I want to make sure that we build the right affordable housing, that we're building it for the right folks, and, and, and leveraging every single dollar. And specifically with these, with these, in, with these WHO funds, you know, the city is, is, can do as much as it possibly can and has no restrictions. When you're tying that to state and federal dollars, guess what? We are then tied to comply with state and federal guidelines that some, the people that were trying to get into those homes may not be eligible. That's one. Number two, and, and, I'll, and I'll just end with this, because I know my colleagues you know, need to go and sell me, is this, is that because we con control that, and I know there's possibly prevailing wage with the, um, with the state and federal funds, but also with our, with our funds, you know, we talk about being labor friendly, about wanting to make sure that we support local jobs. A lot of these developers are not using our trades to do this work. And I get phone calls from these folks all the time saying, what's up? You know, you have all these developers building in your home. We're trying to contact them. And I, I hear boo. Right. So again, you know, up here, you know, using the funds that we have that, that have really, you know, the opportunity to really leverage and also support, you know, our trades here so that they could, you know, be on these jobs as it pertains to construction. We should definitely look at creating criteria for that if we're going to be de dedicating um, the um, inclusionary housing funds. And so those are just my comments, Mr. Mayor. I know you guys have a first and a second. Thank you. Um, additional comments? Council Member Solorio? Yeah, j j just some clarifications. Uh, again, uh, what we're talking about here are loans, and so although we can say that they're 
their subsidy and it's a public uh, investment. It's really more of a financing vehicle. But that money with interest is going to be coming back. So it's not like if it's you know a one-way direction of dollars. Those dollars come back uh, to the city uh, with uh, with with a return on the investment uh, and a product being built that others would not build uh, without these dollars. And really, you know, all these affordable housing. Uh, dollars and programs are built on that assumption that uh, you know the general marketplace would not allow for the construction of these affordable housing units and so all these programs are built on this idea of public private partnerships uh, through financing vehicles like this where uh, in this case the city loans some money but then over time that money comes back uh, so it's not really uh, you know something that that the private sector completely benefits from because uh, that they pay their loans back. That's like saying that when we get a mortgage, that uh, that it's not a two-way relationship, and that they don't get our money. They do get our money with these loans, and so here's well uh, the the city is going to receive that money back. Uh, and then there are also other benefits. Uh, you know, there are going to be property taxes paid on these properties. Uh, the folks that live there are going to buy and shop in town, and so we're going to benefit from from sales tax. And then I also believe that Santa Ana deserves some nice housing too. You know, and I think some of you have heard me speak before that I believe that we need a diverse housing stock. We need, uh, you know, higher end homes, uh, middle income homes, uh, homes for low income and working class folks. But there's no reason why working class folks and poor folks can't live in dignity. Uh, and that's what this policy here, this vote on represents, and I want to see more of it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that some of my colleagues have pushed us in this direction of, uh, of reconsidering some of these projects because they do have merit and they're true public-private partnerships. And again, up and down the state, that's what these type of dollars are for. We got some excellent proposals here, some excellent developers with proven track records, uh, and I'm proud to support these projects. Um, Council Benavides and uh, Sarmiento. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple things with regard to these projects. We, they've, we've gone through the process, uh, and, and I can appreciate the comments about us asking ourselves some of these questions, and they're good questions to ask uh, what, what I do uh, as we're considering these projects. Uh, I think we all have factored in some of that. We may not be voicing all of the questions that, that in long questions that we've considered, that we've read, that we've asked of staff, uh, but but I do want to clarify that it, it is we we've asked some of those questions. I know I've asked myself some of these questions with regard to who we're providing uh, a housing for and uh, a, a number of different things. So so I, I definitely don't want to. I, I think I just I'm concerned that there is some suggestion that there's only one person on the dais is asking some tough questions and the rest of us are sitting here just you know rubber stamping. Uh, what's coming through. I, that's definitely not the case for me, and I, and I trust that the rest of my colleagues are going through the process and thinking through that. Uh, and so that, that's that's the extent of what, what I'm going to say. Good questions, but I think going back and forth and trying to address, and I appreciate Councilman Solorio and trying to address some of the questions that were posed, uh, uh, but I, I think ultimately when we consider, we vote based on the merits, on what we see, what we've studied, and whether we think that it is a benefit to the community. In this case, I do think that that's the case, as I've weighed this out, has a process. I, I do agree with the question about process. Um, at, at least one of these projects has been uh, kind of fumbled, and, and the process has not been as, as clean uh, as, it, as it could have been. And hopefully we've learned from that and have made that come before, and, and we'll uh, go forward and improve on that uh, uh, in future projects and applications. All that said, we, we have a motion a second. I'm going to continue to support the projects. Thank you. I believe we have a comment, please. Yeah, I'm going to withdraw my comment just because at the sake of uh, Sal going to sleep. He already did go to sleep. sleep. So, um, Sal, are you still there? I'm going to out of respect for Sal. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sal. Maybe we just call for the question, Mr. Mayor, after your comments. All right. So we uh, have a motion and a second. Um, so I'm going to support everything except uh, item B. And um, out of, uh, I'm just not comfortable, and so I'm going to abstain on that item. But, uh, Madam City Clerk, I think we have to call a roll call because Sal's not here, and therefore the procedure is we have to do a roll call. Please go ahead. Yes, that's correct. Councilmember Sar Sarmiento? Aye. Councilmember Tina Harrow? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez? No. Mayor Polito? Yes, with the exception of item B. 
Council Member Benavides? Aye. Council Member B Villegas? Yes. Council Member Solorio? Solorio, aye. All right, so motion passes. Um, now do we go to the joint recommended actions in order to finish this, or we go back to the budget? Yeah, well, yeah, because we still have a cell. I want to make sure we yes. finish everything here that we can. So uh, I would entertain a motion on the joint recommended actions. Move the item. Second. Okay, uh, let's do roll call again, please. Councilmember Sarmiento? Aye. Councilmember Tina Harrow? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez? Nay. Mayor Polito? Yes, with the exception of B. Councilmember Benavides? Aye. Councilmember Villegas? Aye. Councilmember Solorio? Aye. So now, uh, just help me out, Madam Clerk. Um, might as well do, should we do the Housing Authority? Do that very quickly, Sal, then you can go to bed. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So. Housing Authority? Let's yeah. And then you can go to bed because that's really quick. I thought that was the Housing Authority vote. Oh. Was that? Isn't there another one afterwards, a consent calendar? The consent calendar had items one and two, and the joint item is the same. So we're done. We're done. All right. Sal? Yes. You can go to bed. Thank you. It's been a long day. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all my colleagues. Hey, be well tomorrow, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank all you. Right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Mayor, are you going to go yes. back to the budget? Now we go back to the budget. Uh, can I just make one comment? I want to clarify some um, process on the budget just to give the council more information, maybe give you some alternatives to consider. So um, in looking at your city charter, you actually have three charter provisions that, apl that apply to how you consider the budget. The first step is that before uh, June 15th of the year, you're supposed to be presented the budget, which you were at the, your first meeting in June. At that time, you can consider it. You can increase, decrease, or admit, uh, omit items if you want to. You're then supposed to have um, the calling of a public hearing, which is what you're doing tonight. Your charter in Section 607 actually gives you the authority, even if you were to have the first reading tonight, it gives you the authority after that first reading to make further revisions, further cuts, additions, or omissions, or omitting items from the budget. So one of the additional alt alternatives that you have tonight is to conduct that first meeting, accept it as part of your public hearing, and then just make sure that on or before July 31st that you actually adopt your budget. If you feel that you might be in a position to adopt your budget at your next meeting on July 5th, that might be a good idea to have that first reading and save you from having to do the resolution. If you don't feel like that's possible, that alternative may not work, but I wanted to make sure you had that option. My understanding and conferring with your finance um, staff is that that has been done in the past where you've done the first reading solely for the purpose of having gotten through the first reading and then made changes after the fact. All right, so now that it's clear, um, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I know I was a maker of the motion originally to put this over and to consider a carryover resolution. Um, I feel comfortable um, supporting and adopting um, the budget so long as we have this two-week period before July 5th to make adjustments, if that's the way I interpreted your comments, uh, Madam City Attorney, uh, to go ahead and, um, and move the matter um, as recommended. But So you're talking about item three alone, right? Or are you also incorporating items one and two as well? I think that would be one and three. And two, you could move or not move this evening. Um, I would consider following uh, city attorney's recommendation to, again, try to avoid that carryover resolution if we can. Obviously, if the adjustments that are recommended between now and July 5th aren't palatable to five members of the council, then we would have to consider the carryover resolution. But in the event that maybe those adjustments are minor, we can go ahead and adopt on time. But I would include uh, number two in my motion to, uh, to adopt all three of the recommended items by staff. Okay, and then what that does is after July 5th meeting, we could put this back forward with any changes that, that you, know, you may discuss with staff or that staff decides to make. And then we could also put as an alternative that carryover resolution just in case you need it. 
So we're just giving you as much um, discretion and ability to make decisions versus putting you in a scenario where you have to adopt the carryover resolution. So this won't, this won't preclude you from taking any of those actions. It just keeps all of your options open. So procedurally, what I'll do is I'll withdraw my original motion that was on the floor and replace it or reinstate it with the, with the motion as, as defined right now by both of us. Um, is there a second for that? Uh, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, uh, so make a make of the motion if we consider again as we're looking at having this 9.3 million dollars uh, carried over from the existing uh, funds year, uh, looking at some type of of uh, uh, investment in, in these couple of areas, again youth services, economic development. I, I would ask that if uh, the uh, maker of the motion, Councilman Sarmiento, would consider uh, modest uh, or, or, or slight modification to. Uh, direct staff to incorporate in this next fiscal year's budget a position for youth services coordinator role and uh, position in economic development to support the economic development uh, manager or the, the department there. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to accept that uh, friendly amendment to the motion so long as we include the language that that's not an, that's not an exhaustive list of issues that we, meet, we may consider as well. So with those, that uh, I'll second with that. All right, comment on, on the current motion, Councilor Solodio. You know, I, I, I think I, I heard the city attorney we also say we, we could support something, and when it comes back, add or make changes. I do feel uncomfortable saying we're approving this and we're adding a bunch of extra positions without knowing what the positions are or where they would be or all the rest. And, you know, we're, we are looking at certain departments' layoffs, and so to be creating... Uh, new programs just uh, with uh, no detail I, I find uh, hard to do. So I, I'd, be, I'd be willing to support the, the original motion with some tweaks, but not with additional positions or programs without details. And again, maybe we could consider that our second meeting when there is some definition or specific proposal. Um, just to the request for the second, you're basically creating two positions, right? Correct, adding two positions to the budget. So maybe the council member Solari would like more information on what that looks like, but I think we have a budget level and there, there are two positions. It's not a complicated change. Um, and we maybe could take that as direction to come back with information about those two positions. Uh, that you could see what they would cost and maybe some options about how to fund them or where other positions might be traded out and then you can make those decisions next yeah, or where, where, would the, where would the positions fall? I know I think in Parks and Rec uh, pursuant to the strategic plan we also added like an arts coordinator We added, yes, uh, funding from the strategic plan uh, packages that you've already appropriated dollars for there's one position being created arts and culture it would be added to the economic development unit mm -hmm. so the economic development position obviously would go with a small but mighty economic development team that we have I think of, of one so this could go from one to two so we kind of know what that looks like the the youth position what, what would it be called and where do you envision it being council member so I, I think can be called a variety of different things what, what uh, one of the models uh, uh, it is a director of uh, well one of the models, director of youth success, that's seen this in in, uh, in another city. Again, I mentioned Denver. Here, we've talked about potential youth services coordinator, and the idea, similar to what, if we look at the the example of the active transportation coordinator. Again, we saw a few years ago uh, high pedestrian fatalities, a number of issues with regard to improving circulation within the city. Uh, so we we created a role, created a position, brought somebody, uh, recruited the, for the position, brought somebody in, who has been very intentional about helping us to elevate. Uh, uh, bringing solutions around uh, creating bike lanes, improving uh, circulation for pedestrians for, for some of our residents on bicycles, and we've seen benefits and, and uh, uh, to that. So it'd be a similar concept. There would be a position that, that I think I, I, well, I foresee in a similar light, looking at what opportunities that we have to leverage some of the uh, resources that are currently available, whether through uh, school district, through nonprofits, through the private foundations, bringing in, bringing in grants, and a variety of different uh, uh, ways to support our young people and allow them to, to you know, more intentionally thrive within the city. 
uh, so some of the the internship programs, somebody right, who would right. be pointed, you know, focused yeah, you know, on I, that. I think I would feel comfortable if part of the scope was, you know, working on the internship program internally within our city and in conjunction with our school district that I know our youth committee has worked on, our joint use uh, a committee with the school district, and I know our acting city manager has been uh, keeping in touch with our, uh, our, our our superintendent at Santa Unified. Uh, you know, w w with, with that understanding now that I know what it is, it'd be in the Parks and Rec Department, maybe for the second reading, we'd know exactly where it would fit. And, and maybe, did you say in the Parks and Rec Department? Uh, that was one, one of the options that I think uh, uh, City Manager made reference of. She mentioned also potentially City Manager's office. I think it, we can see where, where it fits, and that, that would be part of the homework, I think, that for Yeah, I, I just don't want him to be an island. I want him to be part of a team. So maybe just with uh, the, 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 the second reading, there can be some additional... Uh, uh, d d description on, on that. So well, with, with that, I'm supportive. I also do want to go back to uh, what Council Member uh, Sarmiento had also mentioned with respect to the transition of uh, the jail from Type 2 to a holding facility. And I think the budget, it really assumes that it would click in uh, to start January 2018 with, from a, a, just kind of like a dollar and cents perspective. I would just like for us prior to then uh, to take advantage of the results of the jail reuse study that we're paying $200,000 for uh, and seeing if there may be uh, ideas that the council supports from that uh, that could be uh, added into that facility prior to then uh, and that we continue dialogue with our uh, existing uh, federal government partners, which are the Marshal's Office and the Bureau of Prisons. And I know uh, we've been in communication with the California Department of Corrections Rehabilitation for maybe some reentry services that staff explore. So it's not a hard commitment, but just that we explore that so we could try to, uh, you know, use the public asset that we have, uh, generate revenue, and provide uh, good services for our community. So if we can modify, again, as, as the council member had begun to talk about that item two with those points, um, I, I would be supportive. As a friendly Suggestion. Is that uh, suggestion accepted by the maker? It is. I just think I kind of lost track of the original language of the motion. But so long as you know we're not up here defining every adjustment, because I know there there are a couple of items that were better defined that uh, Councilman Benavides um, had suggested. That doesn't mean we can't make suggestions between now and the second reading. Again, if if the if the if the adjusted budget after these two weeks comes back completely different, then I understand that it's, it could be voted down by the council. But if it's, in essence, um, very similar with some minor tweaks, then I think that um, you know, th that's my understanding as, as the motion reads right now. So I'm fine okay, with let, Let's go ahead and vote. Um, we have the motion with the two friendly amendments, let's call it. Uh, but also there's a request by uh, Mayor Pro Tem that as we actually vote, let's bifurcate it. Um, and so, you know, we have the overall motion with the two friendly amendments, and you want it to uh, vote on item one, two, and three separately, mm -hmm. basically? All right, so no longer a roll call vote, because uh, Sal's not here, and we have a motion a second. Right now, let's just vote on item number one. Of the of the three items, so those in favor of item number one, say aye. 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 No. Those opposed, we have one no. Item number two, with and part of the friendly amendment was what we discussed about the the jail. So item number two, those in favor, please say aye. 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 That was unanimous. And then item number three, um, those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. And a no by Mayor Pro Tem. So with that, I think we're done with this item. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Okay. So now we have um, 75D, is it, or are we already? We're on to um, item 75D. D. We have no speakers. This is the Aqua Supportive Housing Project, 317 East uh, 17th Street. Okay. So there's a public hearing. Um, uh, let me go ahead and open up the public hearing and invite members to speak. Do we have cards? We do not have any speakers on no the No speakers. Mm -hmm. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. 
and bring it uh, back uh, to um, the city council for consideration. I think we lost so uh, council member. You're going to need his vote. I think you need five votes for that. Not I think no. you need five votes on no, that, no. correct? Not this. Do not. not. This no. yeah. All right. This one, they say it's four. I'm so it's a negative so declaration, moved. general plan amendment. So move, moved, Mr. Mayor. All right, we have a motion to second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Those opposed, motion one no and, one, and two uh, absent. 75E. This, I do believe we need a fifth vote. I'm a no vote on all of those. And she's a no vote on the next 30 items. No, I'm kidding. But One thing I'd just like to point out to the City Council, I know this is going to be a, be a bit tedious for you, but the next items that you're going to see, these are for the properties for acquisition right. in Bristol. Um, each one of these public hearings, you must make an independent determination in the findings, so I would ask you to at least take a moment to um, add your comments into the record rather than just passing them. Um, it is required if we should have to pursue legal action, this record will be important and necessary to help uh, with our case, so you will need to open up each public hearing at least make a comment. Um, well, as to those did uh, Councilmember um, Sarmiento leave permanently? No, I don't think so. He has his stuff here. Let's uh, let's take a break, and we'll continue in a few minutes. Yeah, I'm going to head out because I don't need. It's going to be as fast as Michelle's gone. Let's just get going. All right, Madam uh, City Clerk, Interim City Clerk or City Clerk Assistant, are we on item, I think it's 75E, correct? Okay, we've got a quorum the minute. Juan is here and David's in the uh, hallway. We ultimately we're going to need Jose too to vote. Yeah, we're going to need five. This is item 75E. Okay, we have a fourth. Uh, this is a public hearing to consider an, an eminent domain resolution for acquisition of real property regarding Bristol Widening Project at 1023 North Bristol Street. So uh, do we have any uh, uh, written uh, comments uh, from the clerk? No comments received, but we do have one public speaker, I believe. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing. And... Um, uh, Chris uh, Peterson is here. And Mayor, may I ask um, on this item, you really do need to have five members of the council hearing all of the public testimony before you can consider this item. Okay. In order to open up the public hearing, you need five. Tell Jose to stop politicking in the back. No. No, here he is. All right, we have a five. Please go ahead, Chris. Good evening, council members. My name is Chris Peterson from Peterson Law Group. I'm eminent domain counsel for the Marlin Trust for Celia Cohen and Jim Cohen, who are the owners of 1023 North Bristol Street. And I would just uh, like to uh, inform the council that we look forward to working with city's eminent domain council in resolution of this matter in uh, Superior Court, uh, despite not reaching a agreement prior to litigation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, you know, we also look forward to working with you in resolving this matter. Um, with that, I see no other uh, speakers, but Madam City Attorney, you want me to enter something specific into the record before I close the public hearing? I'd just like confirmation from, council, from a council member or two that you have actually read the staff report and concur with the findings. Yes. Yes, I read the staff report. Councilmember Yaz is indicating he's def, uh, read the staff report and he agrees with the findings. You know, and, so, I, and, and I, I did as well. And I assume most, I assume we all correct. do. And we're all and Benavides and Solario yeah. have discussed with uh, uh, with staff as well on some of, some of the background with regard to uh, the, the report recommendation. And, and even though uh, Councilmember Sarmiento has been traveling, he's had time. And I had a chance to meet with the city manager earlier today. Got it. 
So with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. We entered that into the record. Uh, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries five uh, and, and then two absent. Uh, 75G. F. 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 Didn't I just? That was E. 75F. This is a public hearing to consider an eminent domain resolution for acquisition of real property regarding Bristol Widening Project at 1302 West 11th Street. I'm now going to open up the public hearing and request Leticia Carrillo approach. Good evening. Hi, my name is Leticia Carrillo, and I own the property on Bristol Street on 11th and Bristol. And so uh, I've been working with the city uh, trying to um, trying to uh, resolve this issue. And so uh, I'm a mother of five children at home. I'm a single parent. And so I have, uh, in the last uh, past 13 years, depended on that office next to that house. This is a mixed-use commercial property. And it's not a regular home, or at least not for me. This is a mixed-use commercial property that's giving me income to pay my mortgage all these many years, even though my mortgage is low. And uh, I did have a retail store at one time in that uh, small building. Right now I use it as an office, and that office is giving me residual income. And I do use that office for um, different meetings that I hold, uh, I've been holding, and I'm not very active in the... Um, and that particular business, but it, it is uh, providing me with some income. And um, so I've been uh, offered by the city, and I, I've been given an offer for the house and the building. They have given me um, credit for so much for the building, and they have given me um, reasonable uh, compensation for the house. If we compare that house to another house, it is uh, pretty um, uh, compatible. Um, and I am not discussing the comparison of it. Um, uh, what I'm saying is this. Uh, at the minute that um, I do accept this offer, I am going to end up with no office, and I'm going to end up with no job. Um, at this point, um, if I was to, uh, to move into what they're suggesting that I should move to, which I would really like to move as soon as possible and relocate my family to a safe place where there's no gangs or whatsoever, with this amount of money that I've been offered, combining the two buildings, I can only get a home, but never an office or a mixed-use property. For there's no comparisons for, for this particular um, property because we have looked and there's nothing. There's only a house or there's an office, but there's no mixed-use that I could um, get for myself and my family. So um, uh, the um, I would like the um, the members of um, the council members to consider to to see this in a different perspective because this property does not fit the regular criteria as a diff a, a, another property. This is a little bit different property, and it's uh, serving different uses. I have gotten um, income property income through the property, and I have gotten uh, uh, money through through the office. So I, this this property is not like a regular home that people lived in and there's no income coming in. And I do depend on that income to help me balance out my family. And that is the one reason I have not agreed on, uh, on accepting the offer, simply because this is a very different situation. And I would like uh, all of you guys to really consider taking a look at this in a little different perspective. I will really love to move out. I will really love to... Leticia, uh, if you yes. can conclude, the light is yes. red and we, we got what you said. We sure. understand. Okay. Okay. Sure. It's it's a little bit sensitive because, you know, we're dealing with the future of my family and I do need to relocate these five children to a safe place in that area. It's been very positive for considering Santana. I really like that area. We have the college next door. My daughters walk to the college. I don't have to buy her a vehicle. I have five kids that will go to that college and just by walking distance two blocks. I have all the chain restaurants in front of me. For a mother, it's a lot of loss. So, so let, me, let me, if I may, let me ask the sure. city attorney. Um, I, I, as we proceed with this, after the public hearing, we take our action. 
we're going to take into account that she's got a pretty unique situation from what she's describing. And we'll look at her income, we'll look at the value of the property, we'll look at everything. Yes, we are, we are legally required to provide fair market value and to provide relocation and, and to make the person um, whole, and that will continue to happen. Even if you adopt this resolution of necessity, we will continue to work with this property owner and any other property oh, owner that you. comes forward. And even as the uh, previous speakers spoke as data of the public hearing, we'll continue to have thank conversations. You. And, and, and Leticia, just a suggestion. If, sure. if you're not getting what you think you should be getting, you're in court. And one thing. Get a lawyer. Yes, I already have three in line. <laughs> I, right. I would like to, to resolve this the best way possible where we don't go, I don't go through all the stress because of my large family, but if I had to, I have to. We have to confront issues here in life. One thing, I'm not going to, uh, they're suggesting to relocate me to a house with four bedroom, two baths. I have a three bedroom, one bath, and I have an office with a bath. Right. And they want me to get a home and use one of the bedrooms for an office, and it doesn't make sense, because that's it's not what not I have. It's not the same. That's not what I have. Thank you so very much same. for listening, and Absolutely. I really appreciate Absolutely. Good luck Thank to you. you. Good you. luck. So with that, I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, Madam City uh, Clerk, can we enter the same comments that we made earlier into the record as to uh, the city council members that are present and the fact that they've read and agree with the findings? Yes, that's correct. All right. You know, Mr. Mayor, and I'd like to add to Go ahead. This is really part of the Bristol Street widening plan. So it's been over many years that we've uh, known of, you know, the need to expand uh, Bristol Street and make improvements. And, uh, we, you know, we always read the findings and we look uh, forward to continue to working with uh, the concerned residents uh, to make sure that we come to the best resolution possible with their respect And this, to I think, is focusing on the area, is it between uh, what is it around Washington and 17th Civic that Center. final stretch so with that uh, do I have a motion so move. motion to move okay we have a motion a second those in favor please say aye. aye 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 that's five ayes now 75 G and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to figure out if we can speed it up because we have we almost run out of the alphabet here we have quite a few more to go um, they don't do that in Pasadena, right? There you go. So anyways, uh, this is 75G, public hearing to consider property at uh, 1027 North Bristol Street. Staff's available for questions. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? I have not received any cards. Okay, seeing no speakers, I will close the public hearing. Um, do you have any written communications? None received. All right, let's include all the previous comments that we made in the other uh, findings, please, into the record here. And with that, I would entertain a motion. Move the item. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries 5-0. 75-H, this public hearing to consider uh, a property for Bristol widening at 2205 South Bristol. And Chris Peterson is representing this uh, uh, person as well. Please go ahead, Chris. Public good hearing is now open. Good evening again, Christopher Peterson, Peterson Law Group, Eminent Domain Council for Victoria Bastida. And I would just look forward to working with the city's Eminent Domain Council in the Superior Court Eminent Domain case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will close the public hearing and ask the clerk to include the previous comments into the record. And with that, I want to entertain a motion. Move the item. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed. Motion carries. I believe we're now on 75 aye. Uh, this is time and place for a public hearing considering acquisition of property located at 2201 South Bristol Street. And guess who's representing these guys? Please go ahead. Good evening, Council Members. Christopher Peterson, Peterson Law Group, on behalf of the uh, property owner, Victoria Bastida, 2205 uh, Bristol Street. And I look forward to working with the city's eminent domain council in a superior court hearing on an eminent domain. Next council. time, can we just have you put the letters on the same piece of paper? We'll save trees. Well, I, requ I requested to do all of these at once. And I'm, if, if, if the council's OK with doing that, I can, I can let the council know which property owners I represent. Well, you represent J.K. L, M, 
and I plus the others well, that you've already Mayor, spoken counsel, to. May, may I ask, make a suggestion? Actually, if we do have legal counsel here and he's not opposed to you taking all of those items in one motion. No, I consent. He, if you he, can, if he is now on the record it. saying that, I would ask, I could recommend that can you take all you, uh, those actions in one item. Can you state it clearly into one. the record? Uh, I consent as the uh, eminent domain counsel for property owners at APN 015-194-23 and 24. Item 75H, property owner at 015-19-25, uh, 75J, property owner at 015-194-36, item 75Q, property owner at 015-194-4175K, property owner at 408 Four seven one zero one, item seventy five M, property owner at four zero eight four seven one zero six seventy five L, and if council would like me to put those property owners on the record that I've already previously spoken on, I can do that as well if necessary. Would you prefer that, Madam City Attorney? Yes, absolutely. And so I would think that's item seventy five J K L M and Q. With his consent, you could open the public hearing. You know, can take action on those items. We yeah. have one other speaker on 75Q, Mr. Javier Mendez. So if he wants to come in and speak on that 75Q so that we can um, open and close all those hearings all those, at once. Yes, you can do that. All right, let me open uh, specifically 75Q. We'll read all the others into the record and consider all those public hearings open and, and about to close here in a moment. Uh, Javier Mendez, please come forward, sir. You're not 75Q? No. Well, you have pretty good penmanship. Everything else is pretty clear. 75 what? R. This is not an R. No, okay, well, no. then we can just ask him to wait a moment and you can take then, action. Then on wait a items. minute, let me finish, and then I'll show everybody this thing and show you <laughs> your R. <laughs> Um, so with that, let me close the public hearing for all the other items that uh, Mr. Peterson, uh, where he's representing his clients, and entertain a motion for all those items. So moved. I'll, I'll second, just with you know echoing some of the previous comments that we have uh, reviewed staff recommendations to a point that has been made previously. This has been a process of street widening that we've looked at for a number of years now. What we're Grown looking at today, with. right? It's a resolution of necessity, essentially uh, public uh, benefit to be able to widen that street, to be able to address safety and uh, traffic uh, flow in that uh, community. We uh, Sounds, find that it's necessary to go ahead and take this action. That's my sec uh, well, that's second. That's a great second. With that, uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Madam, um, uh, Mr. Peterson, did you miss, I know you didn't miss any of your clients, but is there any item that uh, that that we, like N or anything, that uh, we have to still go over? Yeah, I have a speaker. So you have? Not not for me. Um, All right, so you're done. As long as we have H, I, J, Q, K, M, L, E, I'm done. See, uh, you didn't save paper, but you saved a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you all. He gets to Thank go you. home. All right, uh, Madam uh, City Clerk, is it 75N? Make sure. I'm just be, being. Ask touched. Mr. Peterson. G. We did, okay. Okay. So, 75N. This is time and place for the public hearing regarding pro pro property located at uh, 2120 and 2130 South Bristol Street. And I have. Um, I don't know. Giovanni, uh, organization is Newmark Mendel, and Luca maybe is the first name. And Mr. Mendez, when you come up, I'm going to give this to the clerk so she can show you your R. She's the one who wrote it? She said 75Q. You're 75Q. That's why I wrote it. All right, so your Q, your penmanship is not that bad then. You intended to write Q, but it should have been R. That makes me feel better. Please, 
Go ahead, 75N. All right, we'll make this brief. Um, I'm Luca Giovanardi with Newmark Merrill Companies, representing the ownership AU Zone um, Santa Ana LLC for the property located at 2120, 2130 South Bristol Street. And as stated in the letter from our attorney, Lanz and Smith, to the clerk of the council dated June 15th, 2017, the ownership is objecting to the proposed resolution of necessity and any potential eminent domain proceedings. And despite this objection, we do look forward to continuing to work with the city on a voluntary purchase agreement in hopes of avoiding the eminent domain proceedings. And I believe we're close to reaching a settlement on that. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for entering that into the record. Let me now close the public hearing. Let's add the motion that uh, Councilor Benavides, uh, or the statement he made earlier when he made the second, and I'd entertain a motion. Move the item. Mo second by uh, Sarmiento. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Next item, would that be O? Yes, or that's correct. 75. O? Oh. So Mr. Peterson missed somebody. I'm kidding. Uh, so this is time and place for the public hearing regarding uh, property located at uh, 1241 West St. Ann Place, also associated with the Bristol Widening Project. Um, do we have any uh, speaker cards? I have not received any cards, nor All have right, I received I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing anyways and, and request that the clerk add the same findings into the record from the earlier considerations. And with that seeing no speakers, I will close the public hearing and request uh, a motion a second for approval. Move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries. 75, is it Pinal, madam? So this is a public hearing regarding the Bristol Whitening Project. Uh, subject property is 1301 West Camden Place. Do we have any speaker cards? This one right here. Andro Chavez. Yes. Uh, the, the public hearing is now open. Please go ahead. I'm Andro Chavez. I'm a real estate broker. I've been selling real estate in Santa Ana for 25 years since 1992. I'm currently the top agent in Santa Ana, and I rank third in buyers in Orange County. Wow. And I represent uh, the Kessler Hone family. And, um, what company do you work with? We're an independent company. With we're with uh, Repro Real Estate Professionals. Excellent. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. And this is uh, my client, uh, not to be that customer home. And we were negotiating with uh, the Epix Land Solution Company and uh, Surrey and a couple other members that we met with and stuff. And my last email to them was that their previous appraisal has expired. The comparables that they're using are over a year old or they're, they're about a year old and we've had a, a good appreciation in the market in Santa Ana and probably... The mayor's doing a good job, right? <laughs> property values are going up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have to do a new appraisal, right, Madam City Attorney, by law. So don't worry, we'll, we'll have to do a new appraisal. Okay, that was my Last if there's any now. issue, come back and talk to us, but we'll do a new appraisal. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Very good. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to close the public hearing, ask the clerk to, you know, make all the same findings that we've made earlier, and I would entertain a motion. Move the item. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed? Motion carries. Now, uh, this is uh, 75Q. I'm going to open up the public hearing regarding... We've already R. done all Q? Yes. Oh, that was, okay, 75R. There's a public hearing uh, regarding a project at uh, 2223 Bristol Street. Yeah, good evening, Mayor Pulidan. Go ahead. Members of the council. Go yeah, ahead. I own uh, 2223 for the last 28 years. It's a real estate office and a mortgage company. Since uh, probably 23 years, I pay no rent. It's been paid off. So the problem that I have over here, whatever is being offered, it's not really meeting what it's supposed to be. Number one, 
like I said, the comparables are expires and the comparables are out of the area. They are totally different. Even though on the appraisals they put, you know, superior to our subject, location is much better, Bristol and Warner. I get comparables from First, Harbor, some other places that are totally different in square footage, condition, and location. Now, the purchase price that I've been offered is probably about 70 or 65 percent from what it's supposed to be. So that's a problem. And I really question the appraisal. I mean, the appraiser. You know, apparently he works for the city, and uh, obviously he represents them, but he's not representing us. The middle company, which is uh, Epic Land, the same. They're almost forcing you to sign a contract or a purchase contract or a price that is not there. You know, like I said, been way too many years in there. And if they send places to go to lease, it's out of the area either. I mean, either. If I stay on the location where I am right now, from no rent to 750 square feet, I'm paying $3,100. To 1,250 square feet, I'm paying 4,200. To 1,100, I'm supposed to pay 4,500 dollars. From no rent to paying rent, whatever I get is gonna go in a few years. Now, second option, I ask you guys if you guys can help me to stay in there. I already know where the curve of the property is gonna be, where the sidewalk is gonna be. I put a wall, I cut only one office. It's a half of the office. The parking lot of the parking structure will not be, uh, you know, it will not be jeopardized at all. We use the same parking, we have other spaces. Now, if I'm, you know, I'm willing, like I said to the middleman, I'm willing to purchase the adjacent lot if that's what they wanted, at a bigger space for parking. And that option is not given to me. The option is, you know, go to Harbor, Go to first, which I don't think is fair. You know, for the last 20 years I've been there and I love it. I wish I could stay there. If they keep portion of the property, if they keep, I mean, if they buy portion of the property, I'll be willing to do that as long as they're willing to, you know, to. Javier, so let me allow uh, mm -hmm. El Elba Bonilla to speak, and then I'll come back and I'll ask you some questions. Sure. Um, Elba, is Elba here? Please go ahead. I assume you guys know each other, right? Um, just we're right just now. met right now. Just met right now? Yes. <laughs> but you're right next door. <laughs> no, actually, I'm not a new owner. I'm also a real estate, uh, real estate agent. And first of all, good evening to all of you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm actually representing, my name is Elba Bonilla with California Life Properties. I'm actually representing uh, one of my clients. He's a business owner and investor as well. Um, we have been reviewing that you had pretty much uh, acqu the acquisitions of several properties. And we are looking into um, pretty much making a reasonable offer for any bulk sales that you might have. What, what property are you representing? Um, 2235, which um, is supposed to be, it was supposed to be the, uh, discussed the previous uh, council meeting. I was here. It was not on the agenda. But, but I'm just wondering, are you part of 75R? No. Or not? Mm Yes and no. The reason is because my client is considering a bulk uh, purchase. If you're planning to do the, go into that direction, we can go ahead and make a reasonable offer. Well, look, I, I think we can take your testimony, but this is just regarding project, you know, property 2223, and that's Mr. Javier Mendez. That's his property, I understand. Um, and that's what this hearing's about. So if you have another property, M Madam City Attorney or Clerk, how do I take her testimony? She, she's talking about another property. Is the property on the agenda tonight? Not, not tonight, but it was supposed to be on the previous one when I called and they told me go ahead and attend the council meeting. It should be there. Um, I came to the previous council meeting and it was not here. And that's the reason. Can I'm she follow up with staff and can we find Absolutely. out? Absolutely what happened and maybe it's coming right. back next agenda or whatever. All right. Yes. So let's do that. Let's do that. So let me close the public hearing for right now. Make sure we include all the um, other comments that were made, Madam City uh, uh, Clerk. And um, 
And Elva, somebody out of that group of uh, guys over there, pick out the good looking one <laughs> and, uh, and he'll work with you. All right, thank you for he your time. He volunteered, look at this. Thank you. I, I think uh, you talked to Jason today, right? Um, yes. Yes, right. they've already talked and connected okay. and worked. All right, we'll follow up. And, and, and just before we leave this, Javier Mendez, real quick, um, uh, and maybe there's a question for the city attorney. Part of what he is, um, and the city manager, part of what he's arguing is that he's already bought and paid for his building, therefore he doesn't pay any rent, really. And Correct. when they're doing the appraisals, you're getting a bad appraisal, in your opinion, because they're not, not taking that into not account. Not only that, uh, on the appraisal, they do, do two approaches. They do the income approach and the sales comparison. The sales comparison, it's, it's out of, totally out. The income approach, they are using a 260, if I can speak numbers, 260 per square footage. You go there, it's 330, very easily. I don't care, I'm, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter if it's retail or commercial. I still got to pay rent if I go across. I already showed those through, you know, three sp uh, spaces that are available that I can lease, but it makes no sense. So I already showed them a plan that if I could stay in the, in the same property, as long as they cut just portion of the, the, the landscape, I think it'll be okay. Can, can I request this? We'll sure. take the vote and move on, but maybe staff could come back and, and, and see what he's talking about. I'm not familiar with the plan right there, but I know sometimes we have been able to accommodate situations such as that, that home. Is it on Bristol Street, um, right past McFadden, right there on the corner? Um, you know, we accommodated and, it, and go right. look at that house because yeah, this be is the third house from uh, north of Warner and uh, you know east side of Bristol. Look, we're going to see what we can okay. do. Appreciate it. Thank um, you. Who should he work with, or who can we give him as a contact? Jason. So Fred stands up, he shakes the hand, he smiles, but then he points at Jason. Well, That's good. You. So see the Jason. He's okay. the guy against the wall. Work with him. All right, thank you. Good luck. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to council for consideration. Do I have a motion a second? Move the item. Those in, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. So we're done with that. Madam Clerk, Mr. Mayor, where are we now? Can I interrupt you just for a second? Certainly. I, I have a flight to catch tomorrow, and I assume there's no more items that require five votes. And I know... Uh, Mayor Pro Tem is on the same flight as I am, and she left a lot earlier. So I, I just was it get smart that used to say the old you know morning to catch early morning flight to catch. So I got to go. Man, that Please, is no, that is ahead. that is old school. If you're that remembering is old uh, school. lines from Get Smart, so that is um, old school. Look, go I, ahead. Go before ahead. Before I leave, I just wanted to leave the clerk and the rest of uh, members of the council with something that was. Uh, given to me by the city council in uh, Quime, Provincia de uh, Inquisivi, in Bolivia, in the Departamento de La Paz. And I know the mayor probably is familiar with um, many parts of Bolivia, but I, I, I traveled at my own expense, uh, family vacation, but I did uh, 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 take a proclamation on behalf of the city to the city council there. It's a town that my uh, father grew up in, and so they in turn gave me a proclamation to the rest of the city council claiming us guests of honor anytime we uh, visit Kima. So if you ever find yourselves in the Andes and the hills of uh, Bolivia um, in a beautiful small town called Kime, you guys will be well received. Just show this and uh, it's your passport to heaven. So, um, but I just wanted to let you all know that uh, we did some business there and we're, you know, going to see how we can not become sister cities, but just become closer and exchange some, um, you know, cultural ties, some best practices. And there's good folks out there that wish us well and we wish them well also. And with that, I'll uh, bid everybody a good Thank night. you. Thank you for your fine work. Thank you. So with that, are we almost done, Madam Clerk? Oh, this is just like general comment. Uh, Steve Rocco, come on down, followed by uh, Dina Barr, followed by Joshua Lepper, followed by Daniel Nan. So after Steve, Dina Barr. It's been a while, hasn't it? But uh, I'm getting educated and... Uh 
I don't know, who was it who said that uh, an all Latino city council is a racist uh, city council? Oh, oh, that was Polito, right? Yeah, that's right. You were talking about uh, Tom Gordon when you endorsed him for city council. Well, uh, let me just say this. Uh, you know, ter terrific scams going on. I don't know if you're more corrupt or stupid or uh, just plain don't know how to do your job. But the fraud that's going on, uh, especially with the register and the uh, snitch scandal, which was all, all predicated on one, fa one thing, is to keep the uh, organized crime in power and uh, specifically the, the fraud with Rakakis. You're here because of me and the FBI. I ran against you in November and you, and, uh, you got in at 50.7%. I ran against you in 2000, you had 71%. You're not doing too well, are you? Well, the fraud is, is that there is no uh, informant uh, scandal. There, there's informants, but the, the, that was created by the register. And your wife works for the register as well. The problem is, is that you and Rakakis have developed the system of mass murder in, in uh, Santa Ana and Orange County through the public guardian, public administrator. His wife works for the, or used to, for the public administrator. My home has been raided over half a dozen times without a search warrant. They come in there always with the Santa Ana Police Department. By the way, I was really impressed that they spent $300,000 to uh, re-elect you, and then the Board of Supervisors spent $400,000 on an investigation. My entire family has been murdered by you and your organized crime syndicate. All of this information is all included at every single courthouse, from Central Court to the Washington, D.C. Court. All of this. The fact, the paper trail all leads to Polito and friends, organized crime, you, who have created a sewer, who lives in a multi-million dollar home which was bought from Helen Holder. Thank you. Huh? Thank you. Diana, God bless you, because I don't. Followed by Joshua Lepper, followed by Daniel Nam, after Daniel J. Uh, Torres. Hi, my name is Joshua Loper. Um, I'm here with the Knights of Columbus San Jose chapter from St. Joseph Church right up the street here in, off of Civic Center. Um, and I'm here to talk about the intersection of Civic Center and Lacey Street. Um, my, my wife's family has owned the house on the northwest corner there for 38 years and I've spent many, many an evening sitting out there watching cars whiz by on Civic Center Street. And, um, you know, just thinking, why is this not a four-way stop? You know, I mean, these cars are going 45 miles an hour, sometimes faster. Um, and, you know, there's no stops between Bush Street and Santiago. And there's nothing to, to impede these cars from going so fast. Um, the, the corner has a, a kindergarten through eighth grade school, um, the main entrance of which is less than 20 yards from the intersection. Um, on the southeast side is the church, um, and between those two facilities, there's people there 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and the main parking lot is across Civic Center. The only thing stopping traffic there is a crosswalk and a flashing light. Um, I mean, it makes no sense to me that, that there's not a four-way stop there, um, and as a result of of that not being there, um, a friend of mine was was struck by a car on Saturday and passed away. Um, so you know, I've heard that that you know in the in the revitalization plan that they're looking at putting a, a, a rotund there, um, which is great. You know, whatever we can do to slow down traffic, but I know that's going to take time, and and we don't have time. I mean, we, we can't have more more um, um, bloodshed. More, um, I mean, this person was was a citizen of of Santa Ana, somebody who was who who lived almost her whole life here in the city. She was a public servant, and you know, we can't risk people like that. So we need to do whatever we can to expedite, you know, whether it be a stop sign, you know, whether it be a rotun, whatever it is, it has to be done as soon as possible um, before somebody else gets hurt. And, uh, you know, um, us as Knights are willing to, to pitch in and do what we can in the interim, you know, whether as crossing guards or whatever it is we can do. Um, but, you know, I, I really urge you that, you know, if, if it's decided not to do a four-way stop and to do a rotund, Make it a safety, a safety initiative and not a re revitalization initiative and do it now. I, I implore you, please. Thank you. Uh, you were Daniel or Joshua? I'm Joshua. 
quick question, Joshua. Yes. Um, is, that was uh, Charlene, I believe her name yes, was. Sir. Yeah. What's her last name? Hanson. And she was a member of St. Joseph's Church, Saint right? Joseph's she Church, was on yep. the choir. Correct. Correct. And she and was a postal worker. She was a worker. letter carrier here in town Correct. for many decades. Yeah. She actually worked at the post office. I grew up off of uh, 12th Street in Santa Ana, and she worked in the post office right there on King Street where, where I lived. Um, I'm going to adjourn uh, the meeting in her honor. And if you could be a contact because you're really close to her family, maybe you could leave your info with the clerk and we'll get you, you know, a proclamation and whatever we can do in terms of giving that our would condolences be fantastic. to her. And also what I'd like to do is have you talk to staff because okay. maybe we can. I mean, I don't know what we have planned out there, but, you know, maybe we can do something earlier mm -hmm. as you're requesting and we ought to try. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So, Fred, you know Fred? I, I do now after tonight, yes. Thank you. Thank you for right. coming down. Thank you. Now we... Witsapochli. Go ahead. You go next. I'm, I'm You're sorry. Daniel. Go yes, ahead. I'm, I'm Daniel now. Um, go ahead. I'm also here to talk about that horrific tragedy that occurred on Saturday. Um, it was very personal to me. Charlene was a very a friend. good friend of my family's. And as a matter of fact, we were the last people she spoke to on that corner. Um, you know, I, I, we just turned our back for a few seconds. Last thing she said is, I'll pray for you, your family, for no other reason than that's just how what she is. What time was it? This was about, um, well, we just got out of 5 o'clock mass, so about maybe 6.15 or so. So there's still lots of daylight. Absolutely. And uh, so I, I turned, you know, after parting ways with my family, you know, she, uh, she was talking to my wife. I said, I have to go back to the car. I had parked on Minter Street. Um, I forgot something I needed to go just for a couple minutes and when I came back um, you know I, I guess it, it had just happened my wife was talking to somebody else talking to Father David um, our priest there and so her view was obstructed but she was no more than 30 yards away with my young son who was here earlier I couldn't get a babysitter for him but um, you know I mean I, I hope to God he didn't see anything but he's asking like you know he's five years old what what happened what happened and, it, and it's you know how we had to explain this is our friend Charlene that you know you just spoke to just a couple minutes ago so I mean obviously it's it weighs heavy on us but what I you know having seen what what ha um, well I didn't see it actually happen but I saw as the people were getting out of the car thank God it wasn't a hit and run so no one was out on the scene yet um, you know it the way the car was positioned it's clear they did not obey any uh, traffic laws they appeared to have not stopped the way they were um, just kind of stopped in the crosswalk, just turned the corner sharply on the wrong side of the road, as a matter of fact. Ma'am Clerk, before you do the lights. And so, anyways, uh, we, we, we've known for many years now that this is an unsafe um, intersection. As a matter of fact, just today, and I, I think today, you know, it's late, but this morning um, there was an article in the register which discussed the, you know, this, the hazards out here with this uh, particular intersection being one of the worst in town. And um, I, I was pleased to see that, yes, there is a, a plan to go ahead and build a roundabout, as uh, my friend Josh had spoke about, uh, and upgrade the crosswalks. Of course, there was no timelines. Uh, I, I think um, Michelle Martinez, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, had, had said you know, in this article that there was no timeline. It's still in the phase of trying to solicit uh, for uh, contractors' bids to, to do this project. So it, it's going to be quite some time. And we want to be proactive about it. You know, we're, uh, I'm, I'm here on, you know, with the night, other uh, brother knights, Knights of Columbus at St. Joseph's Church. And uh, we had talked to our pastor. We had talked about the idea of maybe volunteering our services to provide uh, crosswalk services. And we wanted, you know, make sure that we cover all our tracks, called the city. We had another brother call the city today. And he was informed that, um, I guess, you know, that concerned about liabilities, that that's going to be an issue, that they don't want us to perform, you know, crosswalk services. So knowing that this is going to be quite some time before this is resolved, you know, I, I really uh, ask you guys to, you know, consider what we can do in the interim. I, I, of course, I, I agree that we need to do that public, um, you know, infrastructure improvement on the corner you have planned. Great to hear that, but if we're not going to get crosswalk services on the, you know, on the weekends during masses, and we can't do them ourselves, I mean, I, I'd suggest that either you get police um, out there on the weekends 
to monitor that, that corner, to you know, either give citations, or even have police or cadets out there directing traffic. Um, maybe, maybe we can uh, talk to the city manager and get a cross guard or something, especially at, right after mass. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know, folks are able to exit safely. And you know, the ironic thing for me about Charlene is she was on the street as a letter carrier constantly, yeah. looking out for cars on streets, crossing everywhere in the middle of streets all the time. So it's just so tragic. But we're going to follow up and. We hear you. I, I think she had a, a a sister, a twin sister. Yes, seventy-one years mm -hmm. old. Yes, and and you speak of ir irony, Mayor. That's uh, you know ironic because you know um, there's there's so much irony in, in that she warned kids and everyone, constantly, constantly, always use this crosswalk, always use this crosswalk, all the time. All of our kids were, were warned by her, and you know, of course, it's unfortunate that that would be the very crosswalk in which she met her. Her death. So, I mean, you know, that obviously stopped. The crosswalk was there. People didn't yield. It, it obviously did Lord, not yield. Let's it's, keep praying it, and thank God for every moment that we have. And thank you for coming down. Uh, thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Now we reach La Poche, followed by, I think he left, but he already spoke. Ilya and Robert Jensling. Laura Perez, I think that's it. So now, any comments? Councilor Jose Solorio. I'm smiling because I do, but I'll try to be brief here. Uh, uh, number one, uh, you know, it's getting warm again, um, and uh, with that, I worry about our medians and our trees. Uh, I know I had a brief discussion with some of the public work staff, and uh, it'd be great if uh, the public work staff could work with our acting city manager to figure out, do we truck in recycled water to water some of our medians and trees? Do we start a pilot program in key areas to do uh, native, na native, guard, native, native plants? Uh, rocks just to see what that looks like and how much it costs just to uh, get going. Um, also, uh, that brings my worry to with respect to fireworks, and I know we're doing uh, some outreach uh, and enforcement through our police department and, and other agencies. I want to continue to encourage uh, our proactiveness uh, on that because I've been getting a lot of complaints about illegal fireworks in town, so let's uh, I'll try to do a good job um, with that. Uh, I also want to thank the, the police department team and their coordination with other agencies on addressing some of the homelessness issues near the river where there were encampments right behind people's homes. And so uh, that has to be done delicately in a coordinated fashion. And I know many agencies uh, work w with that. Um, and, you know, also. Uh, I know today there was an appointment made uh, for David Valentine to be our acting uh, city police chief. So I do want to thank our acting city uh, manager and everybody else in making that selection. He's he's homegrown. He has experience in all the bureaus, uh, and I think we'll do a fine job. And I wish him well. Thank you, Juan Villegas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, briefly, I just want to echo the uh, the words of uh, Councilmember Solorio that I uh, want to welcome the uh, new Acting uh, Chief, Dave Valentin. Uh, brings a lot uh, to uh, the department and, and that new uh, position. And I also want to thank the, the staff for all the hard work, <clears throat> all the hard work they, they did on today's uh, agenda. And uh, we do have faith in you. So um, keep up the good work. And uh, I look forward to uh, working uh, with that. Uh, in the future with some more of these uh, projects that we have. Thank you very much. Councilmember David Benavides. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank uh, all the staff, uh, the staff for all the work that they've done, particularly as we, uh, we've been working on putting together uh, the, this year's budget. Uh, and members of the public came and addressed us. Uh, specifically, with regard to members of the pub public, we had a couple of gentlemen uh, speak to us uh, regarding this tragic incident uh, that, that took place where, where a pedestrian uh, lost her life. Uh, here just a few days ago and uh, one of the things I do want to ask we have them uh, willing to volunteer their time to provide uh, 
you know, a, a service, a volunteer, and, and, uh, and uh, providing assistance to uh, members of the community out there crossing the street. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I understand the issue of liability. However, I th what, so what I would implore our staff, city manager, city attorney, let's figure out a way to have government not get in the way. If folks are ready and willing to provide a volunteer service, if it's writing a letter of liability, a letter of release, or whatever the case might be, that where where I think it's it's kind of uh, an irony and, and, and a contradiction where if we would say, hey, you can't volunteer out there because we don't want liability. Yet people are crossing uh, and getting hurt on their own, and yet we're not in a position where we can do something. We just we just need to be of figure out a, a very I think a very simple and easy way to to kind of get out of the way and allow people to be able to help, you know, just be good neighbors and support uh, each other uh, out there. So if we can uh, uh, figure that out, uh, that would be great. Uh, with, uh, you know, there's, there's, we again considered the budget tonight. Uh, one of the items that was on there, I oftentimes encourage folks, and a number of us on the council have encouraged folks to, to support our local businesses, our, our local uh, uh that create local jobs and want to encourage people to support those jobs and support those businesses and shop in Santana. Uh, tonight, I uh, want to thank the, the council, my colleagues, for the leadership and uh, uh, identifying and looking at in the next budget to be able to support economic development, uh, youth services. Uh, uh, appreciate us all coming together around that. Uh, a lot of great things going on in the city of Santana on, on a consistent basis, and one of those is, is a 4th of July celebration. I think we're going into our, uh, might be our eighth uh, year. I'm not sure if there's somebody from staff. I was looking for, for the uh, flyer that, that can share a little bit about the information uh, for the 4th of July event. My, uh, anyway, I believe it's, uh, it's on 4th of July. I believe uh, activities start I think it's at two o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Then we, I know we have a, a show uh, at uh, fireworks show at nine p.m. and it's a, it's a great time uh, for our families uh, to enjoy just that coming together. Centennial Park, bringing your picnic, uh, and uh, maybe if if we can have. Uh, uh, Jeannie, thank you for Good evening, for uh, Mayor and Council. Yes, 4th of July is coming up on Tuesday, July the 4th. It's from 4 to 9.30. It's a free event to, for everybody to attend. Um, and also just a reminder, it's for the entire family. As a matter of fact, tonight the committee met with staff, oh, and they're on a roll. They're ready to go. So please come on down and enjoy the festivities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. So mm -hmm. 4 o'clock is when it starts. Yes. Uh, if you couldn't mind our members of the, the, the public and... Uh, what some of the uh, activities that w will we still have, uh, some of the activities, inflatables, activities for, for the kids, food also being made available, music, Yes, actually, we have our youth sports department. They're going to have inflatables for the kids. Also, a lot of different obstacle courses, uh, basketball, uh, you know, like a little flag football type of deal. We also have... Uh, we're going to do fundraising, and this is very um, interesting for the mayor, the chess program. Oh, wow. We are going to have a fundraiser with hamburgers for the chess program, so please come on out and support. When begin? At 4 o'clock. How we're many also, tables? Oh, well, okay. So it's a fundraiser uh, selling hamburgers for the public, but we're also going to have some of the kids, you know, demonstrate a little game. So. Well, maybe we'll show up for that. There you go. There you go. Uh, we're also going to have our famous history walk through the committee. Uh, fireworks at 9 p.m., and that's about 20-minute show. But in addition, we're also going to have a second stage this time. And we're having a choir come on down to do a free entertainment for the public, and they're coming from Australia. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a fun time. Yeah. We're also honoring our veterans, local veterans, and so we'll have a moment in time to give something to them as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you for, for, thank you. for coming and bring this uh, up. Again, just a, a fabulous time for our community. Well, I encourage folks to come out, maybe save your money, or, or uh, uh, come out and enjoy this uh, amazing show uh, out here at Centennial Park. And uh, last comment is I, I do want to thank uh, Deputy Chief uh, Jim Schnabel for his leadership and his willingness to step up and serve uh, the city and serve the, the department and our police department during uh, our police officers uh, uh, during his time serving as acting uh, acting chief. And I do want to thank and welcome uh, 
uh, deputy uh, uh, chief and now acting chief uh, David Valentin in the in the new role uh, as well. And I look forward to uh, working with him uh, as well and uh, supporting and working with the rest of our police department. So with that, have a great evening. Thank you. Um, I want to just tell a real brief story on the chess because David kind of got me going on that with the discussion and maybe we'll follow up, but I lost to a grandmaster, a chess grandmaster, but he was blindfolded. He was blindfolded. So you go, you know, pawn, uh, you know, uh, you know, E2 or, you know, queen or the knight or this guy was blindfolded. And after a while, he says, you know, you're playing a little bit slow. Do you mind if I go in another room? And that way I can talk to people and I can drink and I can. So he did. He went to another room and we would just yell out the moves. And he'd yell it back and I'd move his move for him. And it's like, you know, about 28, 27 moves later, I was checkmated. Um, so I, I'd like to figure something out. I don't know through Parks and Recs or I don't know when he gets back. But I'd like to invite somebody like that. I'm sure we can get them here to the city just to show kids and those that are enthusiasts of chess, you know, how much you can really develop your mind if you work on it. Um, so anyways, just a, just a thought. Uh, the other is I, I also want to welcome our new, um, you know, interim uh, chief, uh, Dave uh, Valentin. I hope he's going to have a, a very, very successful uh, effort here with us all. And... Um, you know, we need a, a strong leader right now, and I think he's that strong leader. And finally, just a reminder that we have to thank God for every single day, because look at what happened to Charlene Hansen. And, 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 you know, to the clerk, if we can send our condolences and a resolution and uh, flowers as appropriate um, to her and her family. You know, she was a woman that um, was here, I don't know how many years, but it was decades. It was decades you know, she started working as a young lady, and, and now, you know, she was 71 years old. And the irony is, you know, she would tell people all the time, you know, look both ways, be careful how you cross, where you cross, and you just never know. No matter what you try to do, you never know. So we should pray for her, but we should also, you know, love each other and be thankful for every moment that uh, God gives us. So with that, uh, this uh, meeting is adjourned.